the final chapter. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 Tangent Cube of Science. Nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed, high atop the Edwards Plateau, still waiting for the watcher. Again. <laughs> as always. As always, we're waiting on the watcher. <laughs> so I think we got a good show for you guys. Uh, it's going to be interesting. Pretty busy. Uh, we got George Howard coming on in the second segment to give us an update on the hoops, hoopla. <laughs> uh, and the uh, Cosmic Tusk bibliography. Um, so there's been some... Contro- controversy about the bib from Hoops and a uh, big, massive Twitter Contre-tun. storm. <laughs> so Tess came on to talk to us about that, and uh, I think you guys are going to enjoy that. It was a great conversation. We've already done it, basically. I don't want to you know, pretend that it's coming up when we've already recorded it. So it's coming up for you, but it's in the past for us. This is the, the magic of non-live shows. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's go ahead and do space weather news. Damn it. <laughs> Could have sworn I had that thing ready to go. We're not ready to go. There we go. Space weather news from spaceweather.com. Very short space weather news today. Solar minimum conditions are in effect despite recent signs of life from solar cycle 25. Solar activity remains low. The sun is blank, no sunspots, and the next stream of solar wind, a minor one, isn't expected until January 21st. In the nights ahead, in the nights ahead, auroras will probably be confined to regions very near the Arctic Circle. Current conditions, solar wind speed very slow, coming in at 275.8 kilometers per second, and the density is only 1.4 protons per cubic centimeter. Right on. I got some space news. Okay. Earthsky.org. This is a story by Deborah Bird. It's probably nothing. Gravitational wave burst detected near Betelgeuse. Probably nothing. <laughs> <laughs> the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, and Virgo detectors recorded a burst of gravitational waves this week from an area of sky near the red supergiant Betelgeuse. This unanticipated burst has been dubbed for now S long number F. <laughs> it's prompting some interesting chatter on Twitter because Beetlejuice has undergone an unusual dimming in recent weeks, which we reported on here at uh, That's right. Snake Press. And some astronomy enthusiasts have wondered if it were about to explode. Beetlejuice has not exploded. It's still there. <laughs> still, a supernova explosion of Beetlejuice might be linked with a gravitational wave burst. As Jackson Ryan explained on CNET last night, which is January 14th, and this story is... Uh, from yeah, there Janu- would be there would be a gravitational wave because the core collapse. Would- yeah, this is from January fifteenth, by the way, the story. Uh, so Jackson Ryan says the gravitational waves we've detected so far usually relate to extreme cosmic events like two black holes colliding or neutron stars finally merging after being caught in a death spiral. Burst gravitational waves have not been detected before. And scientists hypothesize that they may be linked to phenomena such as supernova or gamma ray bursts, producing a tiny pop when detected by the observatories. Wow. Astronomer Andy Howell at Las Cumbres Cumbres Observatory leads a group that studies supernova and dark energy. He posted some especially informative tweets about Betelgeuse last night. And he says... uh, that face when you walk outside to check if Beetlejuice is still there. <laughs> I just did it. <laughs> yeah. I've been doing that, too, actually. <laughs> and it is still there. Yeah, I've been doing that, too. Every, yep. time, every time I go outside, I'm like, is it still there? So as far as it's we know, there. folks, it's still there. But it's daylight here, and you may be listening to this show long after Beetlejuice has exploded. So right. you better go check. Right. Um, it's the left shoulder of Orion. Yeah, you didn't know. Yeah. So as Andy said in one of the tweets above, gravitational wave detectors do sometimes detect false positives about once every 25 years. So that is something to keep in mind. The most important thing to keep in mind is that Betelgeuse has not exploded as of the writing of this article. Estimates suggest it won't explode in our lifetimes, 
Probably. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think the one I was reading about it, they were saying, you know, could happen very soon within right. the next 100,000 years. So the bottom line, the LIGO and Virgo detectors this week, which was last week, recorded a burst of gravitational waves from an area of sky near the red supergiant Betelgeuse, which has recently undergone a mysterious dimming. Hmm. Nothing to see here. Yeah. Don't worry. It's still there. Wouldn't that be interesting? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like the Yellowstone earthquake reports. Yeah. Right. How 500, do we know? 500 mini earthquakes happen in Yellowstone, but don't worry. Look, nothing's going look, on. Look, seriously, though, like they say the gravitational waves travel at the speed of light, but they are ripples in space time. Yeah. So how do you how can you predict how fast a yeah, ripple go, in time passes? Right. It could go as fast as it wants. And it would be interesting if when those, time is compressed, those ripples got here. Way before, before the light does. The light. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So it may have exploded. Yep. And we've just detected the gravitational waves, what the, the space time waves, yep. long before the light gets here because they're passing us at, you know, super luminal speeds. Yeah. It looks like they're going light speed, but they are actual ripples in space time, folks. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> they're bringing the time with them. Right. When you're not in the ripple, <laughs> it looks like they're moving at light speed. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Yeah, they're great. bringing the space and time with them. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, too. <laughs> Love it. All right. We have a whole bunch of emails here because we didn't do any. We didn't read any for the last week's show, which was the Chris Dunn episode. And of course, we got a bunch of emails about that episode. So I'm going to go through some of these here. I can't obviously can't go through them, all of them. But thank you all so much for writing all these emails. I, I have read them all and they're all great. I just can't possibly read them all on the show we got this one from paul Moore, uh, paul whoo that was close. close real close to doc's got that the guy. first two letters <laughs> hey snickies at the end of part four of your podcast on dunn's pyramid power plant theory you mentioned the possibility you possible use of a satellite as far-fetched as this is have you heard of the black knight satellite i'm not sure how credible this is but some researchers say it is real and it is about twelve thousand years old might be worth looking into zahi hee ha <laughs> <laughs> we have heard of the black knight satellite and i think we did a, an episode on it years ago um uh, but yes uh, some people I, th so the black knight is if it is a, a, a satellite of some kind it, it seems to be automated and it doesn't stay in earth orbit so it isn't you know chris was basically talking about a reflector uh, now, of course, it might be automated in some ways, but this thing seems to fly all over the solar system. So I don't know if that could be it. But yes, it does seem to be an ancient satellite. It just keeps coming back to check and see if there's a microwave beam yeah, coming yeah, out of the pyramid. Coming, and it's right. like, nope, nope, I guess I'll go back and look around the other planets right. for microwave beams. <laughs> <laughs> but wasn't there something about how it, uh, it indicated that it was from somewhere really far away? I can't remember. What no, I don't remember. Uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, Joanne, I just want to say, she said she with it, that the podcast is comfort in a time of crisis. She's from Australia, and they've had all those horrible fires. Oh man, uh, people lost their houses. Um, so she says that the podcast is comfort in a time of crisis and thank you for that i'm uh i know wow. those fires were awful yeah uh, yeah it feels good to know the yeah to know we can help in some small way thank yes. you very much for that uh okay so this is cool from troy he says more than bananas nuts <laughs> Sorry, Snake Bros, I realize this might be more like homework, but after listening to episode 56, Bananas Are Impossible, I remember reading about almonds being poisonous and then domesticated in Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel. After doing a little poking around, I discovered the truth is more bonkers than I thought. And he gives a bunch of links here. Uh, so he says, originally almonds were deadly and may, and the taming of them basically may date back 12,000 years. And that is actually from Whoa. India. It's like a... Oh. Yeah. So maybe Kyle can read that on the next show he can do. It must have been a very exciting story. Yeah, it's probably very exciting. <laughs> NPR. Almonds. NPR. How almonds went from deadly to delicious. <laughs> <laughs> 
But now for a brief break. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so thanks for that, Troy. I saw a huge snakes sign off at the bottom of that email. Yeah, there was. It's snakes. That's right. I, <laughs> I mean, you know, the yeah. font was like so big. Yeah. <laughs> 108 size font. Yep. <clears throat> Uh, so John sends us uh, an email about pyramids in uh, Cambodia. A Hindu pyramid in Cambodia may prove origins of Mayan civilization. He says, love the podcast, guys, and it's great what you're doing for Cosmographia, too. Keep up the good work, and I shall chip in a few pennies once I figure out how Patreon works. Cheers, John. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Yes, yeah, planning to check out those mystery walls up in the Berkeley, Oakland Hills soon. I shall send you pics if anything looks interesting. Yes. All right. Get out in the field. Send us photographs. Awesome. Those are those walls in California that just go off into the, into the hills. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Let me make sure I'm doing this in order here. Another John. S is the title. S <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so this guy is giving us people he wants us to look into about how people were may have lived a very long time in ancient times. So I'm not going to read all of it because there's a whole bunch of stuff, but thanks for that. This is This is from John. Again, another John. So he says, I came upon your podcast in early 2019 when I was on the hunt for fellow people who share the wondering eye for the real truth, whether, whether we eventually find it or not. I have been wanting to write you for some time, and for whatever reason, I feel compelled to now. And he, then he says, you talked a bit about the age of people like Noah on your show with Mike and Maurice. <clears throat> and then he asks, do you suppose back in early biblical times they declared their age by moon cycle? Mm. So that's a good question, and some people have asked that. John, I don't think so, because not everyone lived extremely long. Like, in other words, the numbers weren't really big for everybody. So some of them would not have lived past like three or four years old if it was just moon cycles. Yeah, that's a good point. So you can't, you can't, uh, I don't think so. This is a, uh... okay, we got another one from Paul who wants to know if you've heard of Amseti. Yes, I have heard of her. Very strange story. Paul, I don't know what to think of that. She was supposedly, she claimed to have been a reincarnation of a lover of Seti the First. Hmm. And she seemed to know a lot of stuff about him. And actually, she moved to Egypt and helped research. And she knew, like, sites of stuff that hadn't been found yet. Wow, everything. that's crazy. Yeah, that's really, yeah. <laughs> wow. So anybody listening to that, interested in that, look up Om Seti. Uh, very, very strange and interesting story there. Yeah, so thanks for that, Paul. Be cool uh, if she could find herself like entombed somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so this is from Martin. He says, "Dear shiny snake bros." <laughs> so I know where you're coming yeah, from. Yeah, yeah, Cosmographia <laughs> convert here. <laughs> Found you guys about a month ago through Cosmographia, and I love the show. I've now caught up on every single episode, as well as the swap cast with Mindscape and others. You guys rock. Anyways, I'm sure you guys saw the recent article about the recent change of thought that Jupiter may be flinging asteroids our way instead of being a cosmic shield like thought previously. Do you guys find it interesting that Zeus and other patriarchal pantheon heads are also known to fling thunderbolts at us? Now, and now we're getting this interesting find. And he's got a New York Post article here. New research finds Jupiter is flinging asteroids at Earth. He says, we're now also seeing research into the Ragnarok mythology referencing climate change in the 6th century BCE. And then he gives a link here, ancientorigins.net. Uh, history, archaeological Viking runestone that has a, the runestone has a story on it about massively claiming, ch changing climate. He says, how much more can we learn by analyzing ancient mythology and decoding the metaphorical language used to explain real world, real world events? Is there anyone dedicating themselves to this kind of mythological research that we can follow. Keep doing amazing work and don't let the haters stop you from laughing. Snacks! <laughs> Listen, Martin, that global warming tablet is fake news. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did, I did actually read those. So, you know what? I, I, I feel dumb because I skipped over the, the Jupiter story because I was like, yeah, it's always throwing stuff at us. But I got it backwards. You're right. The the idea was that it it was like a shield, yeah. keeping stuff from us. But right. but I was always, 
I, I guess I was under the impression that it's the big planets that are like drawing these things in and kind of bring them into the inner solar system. But yeah, I think that the I think that what the theory is now is that it's both that the the planet, the outer planets are perfectly sort of situated to play this kind of hot potato game with right with objects coming in. And a lot of times Jupiter will just absorb consume them. them yeah but it may take a long time they have to be passed back and forth and around and around but over time jupiter just gets them closer and closer and closer and eventually <laughs> ow. yeah so but sometimes that doesn't happen and jupiter just hurls it towards the inner system and then yeah. all hell breaks loose on the rocky planets you know past the asteroid belt so that's yeah. the idea is that it's both but the question is is how often does one or the other take place and right. what's the rate? But I think that I think that his comparison to the, to yeah, the Gats Zeus throwing chunk and lightning bolts <laughs> yeah, at us. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. That's right. Brilliant. Here's another one from Paul. This is actually just a continuation. He says, he says, uh, I was also wondering if you guys knew what those little metal finger type hooks were on the corbelled ceiling of the Grand Gallery. I've noticed them for years, but I've never been able to find out what they're for or who put them there. Please give me a shout out if you know. Thanks, Paul. And then he signs it Zahi Jackass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> we love zahi hawas on this podcast guys that's right yeah favorite favorite archaeologist ever uh paul i don't know but my first guess would be an attempt at an installation of lights yeah that's what i was thinking too uh, hanging the hanging wire wire yeah um could be wrong but that's i couldn't find any information about it just like you were saying but that's my first guess as a as a guy who's dug caves and strung lights in them, that's what they look like to me. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, this one's from Anne. She says, time to admit I'm weird. Greetings from the dusty reaches of my book-lined nest. With your interest in frequencies and wavelengths, I have decided to relate an experience I have had. Sometime around 1968, probably in Scientific American, I read about an experiment in Russia. They were always doing interesting things where people were trying to determine colors by touch. Entered try this at home mode. <laughs> <laughs> Using a set of markers with barrels that were identical except for their strong, solid colors, I held one and concentrated on what kind of tingle I got in my head. Long practice brought success, which was met with a total lack of interest by everyone. <laughs> no time for such nonsense, you know. Finally, I got my mother to pause for a demonstration. This startle startled her, and she slammed the door of her mind. So the point of the long story, which I did not make short, <laughs> this should not work. I know that. When I touch something, I am blocking the light, and so there is no color reflected, and yet it only works if I make contact. Maybe someone else with hours of time on their hands would like to experiment. Best wishes for all your ventures in this new year, Anne. That's awesome, Anne. Uh, yeah, that's cool. We did a similar brief test of, like, can somebody tell something is magnetic or not? Uh, oh, Yeah. That's right. And Kyle didn't even tell me what was going on. He just like, close your eyes and hold your hands out. And that's a very dangerous thing to do with most people, but I trust Kyle. So I did that. And he put two metal objects, one one metal object in each hand, and he said, what? And they're what both you, the same shape and yeah, size. Yeah, same and, shape and size. And I was like, this one over here feels weird. And that was the <laughs> magnet. <laughs> that's right. It happened. So I don't know, Ann, but that's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's her. Yeah. So thanks for the uh, thanks for the uh, donations for sure. Yeah, and, and serious donor, we need a, did a <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Snake Force Commander and. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We just connected the names from the uh, email to the to the. Uh, she, it's a one-time donation, but man, a big one. So thank you so yeah. much. And yeah, dude, I. All the Snake Force people out there that are listening to this, give this a shot. Can you, with practice, learn to tell, like, a, do a blind test of where you grab some, like, you have a bunch of things in primary colors, you reach out and you grab one of them, and you can tell what color it is just by somehow touching it. Very interesting. I mean, like, the, f the physics, right? You're blocking a frequency, and so if you can somehow pick that up, that's very interesting. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Should not work, but does. Or maybe you're, you know, psychic. Uh, let's see. All right, this is for, this is a comment off the website from Mr. Fontini. Hey, Fontini! <laughs> he says, hey, when you're making the scale model of the pyramid, you should get GMA to print it in, like, centimeter-high pieces 
That way you can stack them to make the complete pyramid, but also remove layers so that you can see the internal rooms and passageways so you can have an actual replica of the full thing inside and out. Just thought. Just a thought. <laughs> Yeah, that would be cool, yeah. but way too hard. Yeah, probably not. Because I barely touch it, and it would all fall apart. I'm like, nah. Yeah, and that's not what the model is for anyway, right? Yeah, I want to put, like, I want to put um, organic stuff in there and see if it doesn't rot. Yeah, right. He's testing something else. We're not testing the power plant theory. It's just. But it would be really awesome to have a scale an model. actual model of the pyramid with blocks and stuff that you could actually... Yeah. Remove and see like the interior. But the problem with that is, is every freaking block is different. I yeah, mean, I know. to actually be, build a it real would be a model. puzzle, it would yeah. be like the craziest, hardest three puzzle. dimensional puzzle. Yeah. And it would have to be huge in order for me to get my fat fingers around the individual pieces. Yeah. To be able to place them correctly. Yeah. So Mark has sent us a bunch of pictures. He's actually going. He's traveling right now. He went to Saxawaman. He's going to Machu <sighs> Picchu. So he sent us these pictures of like, he's like, some of the big blocks, some of the weird ones. This is the, an inside corner at Sax That's Walmart. awesome. Yeah. Wow. Thanks, man. Yeah. These are beautiful photographs. Super jelly. And this is one of the big ones. Look at that thing. Jeez. God. <laughs> uh, and then he sent another one. This is also nearby. It's called Rainbow Mountain. It's a. Uh, Strange ge geology. Oh, wow. There. Yeah. Like uh, sandstone or something. Right. Eroded uh, sandstone layers. Like the layers. painted desert. Yeah. 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 Very cool. Thanks for that, Mark. Those are beautiful photographs. Uh, okay. This is from Ian. He says, hey, Russ and Kyle, warm and fuzzies, my snake bros. Your podcasts have been so awesome recently. I've been loving the Chris Dunn book overview. In fact, I cooked Christmas dinner whilst listening to episode two. I was previously not too familiar with the details of his theories, but I am now realizing what an absolute legendary genius this snake bro is. <laughs> Looking forward to the final installment. Gotta buy the book. I've mentioned before that I freaking love the Epic of Gilgamesh episode, uh, but man, the follow-up episode, which is number 68, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, was so mind-blowingly awesome. Uh, yes. Linking into some Hancock content with the hidden analogs in the Epic of Gilgamesh was a real treat, i.e. characters representing different races and forces of nature. Mind also blown by Manly P. Hall. Got to get some time in checking out his lectures. I'm at a stage where I feel there is a lot of telling and hidden information within the Hermetic and ancient teachings and texts which can unlock a much deeper understanding of the ancients. On episode 54, EM Fields and Ancient Technologies, you guys are on fire. The content about EM Fields affecting dolmens, water, and ancient structures is right on the button for me. I've always wondered if the pyramids and stone circles were tapping into our Earth's magnetic energy or built to enhance Earth's electromagnetic field for some unknown purpose. Going to use my snake brain to deep dive this concept over the coming weeks. Anything you snakes can recommend, keep up the great work. Peace. Thanks, got, buddy. Yeah. Man, that was really cool. The 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 dolmens and yeah. the water, that story about the water with the DNA and how it can <laughs> yeah. copy yeah. DNA. Yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and he says, okay, he said another one. He said, by the way, I had a mind fart earlier. Met metaphors, not analogies in relation to the Gilgamesh story. Also, I wanted to say I really want to donate some English quids to you boys. But due to our government being utterly shite and I and generally only serving the rich and privileged, I am totally skint. <laughs> <laughs> I am seriously considering robbing a bank. So you snake rose me and the entire snake force can all go straight to pyramids. Do you accept? Do you accept diamonds and gold? Peace. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, we here at the Brothers of the Sermon podcast do not condone bank robbing to don donate to the podcast. But um, we'll we send you our PO uh, box in that's the right. email. We do accept diamonds and gold. We accept <laughs> we accept what we call one up boxes. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey man, uh, send you some uh, some cash karma. You know we uh, we have uh, I don't know if our karma works, but. We all hope for you to yeah get away from being skint, you know, get close to being rich, rich and privileged. And like, that's that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And then the government will serve you. That's right. <laughs> that shite government <laughs> will serve you, that's sir. That's right. <laughs> uh, You're going to be OK, kid. <laughs> You're going to be OK. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is the music. The 
guy sent us. Oh, yeah. So we got to have this, too. Oh, I forgot. To yeah, so this... I'll, I'll grab it. Okay. Yeah. Ronnie says, Greetings from the plains of Oklahoma. I have been listening to you guys' podcast and really enjoy it. The content really stimulates my brain, especially the Giza power plant. After listening to the first two, I immediately stopped and purchased the book for myself and consumed it fairly quickly and can't wait to listen to the rest. It makes you wonder what else can improve by directing sound waves. Keep up the great content. P.S. I have attached some music I recorded inspired by your guys' podcast and this book, and you can use it if you want to. And Ronnie, we listen to it. It's awesome, and we're totally yeah. going to use it. So maybe it'll be at the end of this of this segment. Can we do that? Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, I threw it. it yeah, yeah. I threw down the... I'll try. I'll try. Okay. Because I already... We did the George Howard thing, and oh, I put that's the right, bumper that's music right. in there. Yeah, no, no, no. We'll, we'll, we'll throw it at the we'll, end. It'll be in here. We'll it'll throw it at the end of the George Howard yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, bro, you gotta let us. Uh, I was wanting to ask you if we can, uh, you know, collab. Yeah, Kyle let wants me to throw some throw sick bass line. Throw down in there. some bass on it, or get get old Dozer Dan over here to to drop some bass on it. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, but yeah, it's great. Yeah, it is really good, <laughs> catchy. Um, okay, so this is from the C Word podcast. Hey. It says, recently listening to episodes 85 and 86, the Oopa Oot Project and Ganton Brings Door. These are some of my favorite episodes, and not just because we get a shout out at the end of each one, <laughs> but because <laughs> I think... No, no, it's a shout out. <laughs> oh, that's right, a shout out. <laughs> <laughs> but because I think Ganton Brings Research is some of the most interesting to come from the Great Pyramid, and as we all know, that's saying a lot. But I write to you because I had a thought. Not sure if you guys talked about this or not, but Ganton Brink references the tank trap at about 173 feet up the shaft. We know the shaft is 240 feet, so roughly 72% of the way up the shaft in the Queen's Chamber, Upaut encountered the tank trap that Ganton Brink said was consistent with features indicating a chamber. He was confident in his claim as he had experienced similar features near other known chambers. What makes this one interesting is the obvious lack of a known chamber 72% of the way up the Queen's Chamber shaft. Scan pyramids is into the chat. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> scan pyramids enters the chat. You guys touched on this, but if you sketch it out, the end of the so called scan pyramids big void lines up in very close approximation to 70 to 75% of the way up the Queen's chamber shaft. This doesn't prove anything, but Ganton brings evidence backs up what the scan pyramids team has discovered. Anyways, thought you might like to dig into it a bit more. As always, we love the show and everything you guys are doing. Keep up the amazing work, Matt from the C Word. Yeah, that was brilliant. Great, yes. And actually, I think. There was some of that was gone into in the previous episode with Chris Dunn and, and uh, Eric Wilson and uh, Robert Valter. Yep. But good catch. Yes. Genius. Good catch. And everybody should check out that podcast. The C word as in conspiracy. So that one guy asked me, where, where, where can I find this C word podcast? And he spelled it S E A W A R D. Uh, like, like C, like C towards word. The C, yeah. Uh, towards no, the no, C. No, 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 no. The C word as in the conspiracy word. So look them up. Great podcast. Uh, okay, that's not one to read on the show. Somebody wants to meet us at Paramania. Man, you better snag that that name, Matt. Somebody's gonna yeah. Somebody's gonna snag. You better C-word. take it now, because <laughs> just to redirect it to your to your website. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, Ken asks snakes. Hey, my bros, did you ever do your synopsis of the Book of Enoch? Not yet. Oh, <laughs> dang! I'm gonna write that down. Yeah, right we now. need to do that. <clears throat> My trusty notepad. <laughs> All right, this is one where it's from the stash. Papa Snake, called Snakes in Winter. He says, Dear Snake Sons, well, I found this article and thought you would enjoy it. It seems that our Texas snakes don't hibernate the way some mammals and such as bears do. They come out to enjoy, enjoy warm sunshine on winter days. The article seemed appropriate for your show since it quoted the snake expert whose name was Todd Jurassic. <laughs> <laughs> I was really taken aback. Pun intended. You just can't make this stuff up. Also, he says that snakes like warm rocks, so be careful when you are out high atop that Edwards Plateau on those ancient seabed rocks. I'm sure those ancient Egyptian structures have some pretty warm wa- rocks waiting for you. Snakes to pyramids. And I am really enjoying the episodes on the Giza power plant, Snake Stash. <laughs> <laughs> that guy's name is Todd Jurassic. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Yeah. <clears throat> and the article is from Fish and Game, so interesting article. Oh, yeah. There. Yeah. That is cool. Yeah, because you do see them in... in uh... Yeah, I've seen quite a few recently when we yeah. had some warm days, yeah. Yeah. Uh... Sneaky little. <laughs> 
All right. You think that they're like, you think I'm sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Shit's getting pale. <laughs> All right, this is from Curtis. He says, what's up, brothers? I have been listening now for quite a while, and I have to say that I listen to a lot of different podcasts, and recently I have begun eliminating some from my list as I have become more of a discriminating listener. I can say now that out of all the ones I hear, you dudes are by far the most intellectually stimulating, and you've opened a new world for me. I was not interested in Egyptian, Egyptian pyramids, or more accurately, my childhood interest had reached a point of satiation, and the Egyptologists had pretty much eliminated the mystery for me. And then you guys came along. The last five episodes. Satiation? Of, sat, yeah, satiation. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Satiation. Uh, satiated. Satiated? 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 Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I think it's satiated. Okay, that's probably right. It says, the last five episodes about Giza as a power plant have blown my mind. I listened at first the way I watch ancient aliens with a smirk and a wry sense of skepticism. <laughs> but the evidence was so meticulously detailed that I found myself being drawn in. I listened to all five episodes several times. The most recent one where you interviewed the author was The Clincher. Now I hear the brilliance of those engineers and that they are not crazy at all. And wow, now I am intrigued. I just got through watching a video of Michael Cremo on Forbidden Archaeology and Extreme Human Antiquity. Have you guys interviewed him or read his books? So, no, we haven't interviewed him. We'd love to. Gotta I, do it. We have read his books, though. Yes. Tell him to call us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he says, there is a fascinating synergy between his data and that of your recent guest, Christopher Dunn, as well as Randall Carlson. There is solid evidence that humans have existed far beyond the 200,000 years that most mainstream anthropologists believe. These same people say that Neanderthals existed for 500,000 years, but think Homo sapiens have only been around for 200,000 years. This seems like an absurdity. Even recently, we have found petrified footprints of what appear to be modern humans that are millions of years old in Europe. Physical evidence in the Americas suggests that humans have been there far beyond the 14,000 years that is commonly cited, and perhaps for up to 250,000 years. Yep, all that, I agree. The, the Clovis first thing for the Americas is falling apart, but so often you still see it referenced in popular articles about science. Yep. Annoying. Yeah. He says, now I have some questions and statements and some corrections for you. Number one, misled is not pronounced misled. I have heard you re read that several times. It is misled as in to be led astray. <laughs> God dang it. <laughs> Why does no one tell me this stuff? <laughs> Looks like misled to me. Apparently misled is not a word. It's just misled. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> we talked about this last night. Yeah. <laughs> and I never caught it that he was saying that and i was i i'm like i don't remember you saying that word but i'm probably just assuming it means like confused or yeah, something yeah <laughs> i've been misled my entire life that word is do does not exist so it's we agreed misled. we agreed that my job was was to um make corrections if i notice it yeah because a lot of times i'll hear some word and i'll just be like it's maybe uh, <laughs> it's uh, not quite uh, right yeah and then i just ignore it <laughs> don't do that okay he says, two, I've heard you say that the Egyptians did not have the wheel. They most certainly did have the wheel, else how did they have chariots? Okay, this is a great yeah. question. Yep. The Egyptian civilization lasted for 4,000 years. So when we say that they didn't have the wheel, what we're talking about is old kingdom. Yeah, the the, the great pyramid builders. Yes, quote so unquote. like the, the pre-dynastic Egyptians and then the first, the first, second, third, and fourth dynasty old kingdom Egyptians supposedly, according to mainstream archaeology, did not have the wheel. But yes, it shows up eventually, and then of course Hellenistic times when uh, the Greeks are running the place. Yeah, they they had the wheel, they had chariots and stuff. But according to the standard model, this is why we joke about it. They didn't have the wheel in the old kingdom, which is when all the big pyramids were built. So, yep, it's got to remember it's a very. But we also don't agree that. with that. Yeah, we don't uh, agree. With I that. mean, if, first of all, if you have block and tackle, you have a wheel. Yeah, <clears throat> in my That's opinion, right. it's a pulley. It's called a pulley, but. I mean, how can you have a pulley and not understand the fundamental principle behind, uh, behind what you do? You've yeah. got an axle. You've got this wheel. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, if you're rolling giant blocks on logs, yeah, the principle of the wheel is there. Right. So. Yeah. Okay. He says three Latin American Indians did not have a wheel. That is true. Okay. Some people say that. I don't know. Four, unlike Egyptian pyramids, to my knowledge, the Latin American pyramids are completely different, structured differently, their stones are small, and they do not have a complex internal structure that the Egyptian pyramids do. I studied anthropology, I was a Spanish teacher, an amateur researcher of Mesoamerican cultures, and while I am no expert, I can state that I have not read anything that connects the Egyptian pyramids to the Mesoamerican ones, except that ancient 
Nahuatl myth states that Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent god, arrived in Mesoamerica from the east, riding a ship made of reeds, had scales like a serpent, maybe chainmail, red hair and blue eyes, and feathers from his head, probably a helmet, and taught them how to build pyramids and forbade human sacrifice. General consensus is Quetzalcoatl may have been an actual Phoenician sailor or warrior, but the Phoenician stepped pyramids were nothing like Egyptian pyramids. That's all very interesting. Yeah. Cool stuff. Five, question. How is it possible a Phoenician taught Mayans how to build pyramids, but not how to use a wheel? <laughs> That's a great question, too. It is a great question. Once again, I mean, I'm not sure the people that built those pyramids did not have the wheel. Right. This is still the sort of standard model. I, I don't even actually, I'm not fully sold on the, the timeline. Right. Of um, Those pyramids may have pyramids. been discovered by those people i mean in some cases the you know like definitely down in peru the at least the original uh reports were that some of these structures were not built by the people that they that were found there by the europeans but instead had been there for much longer <clears throat> so i don't know it says all righty then i love what you guys are doing if you and randall and the rest of the snakes get together again i want to go i grew up in the desert southwest the anasazi ruins are like my childhood playground those episodes kept me up at night Awesome. By the way, awesome music from one musician to another. Keep up the great work. Snakes! <clears throat> wow, thanks, man. Go yeah. to uh, Scablands, Yeah, buddy. go to the Scablands trip. S get a hold of Darren at Grimerica.com. Just tell him you want to sign up for the Scabland trip. So we're, we're going to the Scablands in northern Washington state with Randall at the end of this year, September-ish. Ish. Yep. So there's, there's still some spots left if you want to go. <clears throat> But thanks for the email, dude. That was really cool. And thank you for correcting me on the word, you know? Yeah. I've been five, He's I'm very happy. Misled about this. <laughs> <laughs> He's been misled about this his entire life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. James, Ancient Origins of Vermont. He says, hi, guys. A friend showed me your podcast recently. Great stuff. Thanks for the work you do. I am an avid researcher of our hidden past, and I recently moved to Vermont. I listened to your episode on stone root cellars in Vermont, like Calendar 1 and 2, and you mentioned a couple of Vermonters, Brendan and Sarah, I believe. I am eagerly looking for, for others in Vermont who share this passion and are doing research in the area. So I'm wondering if you would be willing to give me their full names and, if possible, an email address where I can reach them. I'd really appreciate it. Thanks, James. So, James, good news. They are from Vermont. Bad news. Brendan lives in Texas and Sarah's in, in New Zealand. So Yeah, but she will, she'll be back probably in the in the summer she doesn't stay there through the winters and i mean what are you going to do go look at a freaking pile of snow you might be able to get into a chamber in the yeah. winter time but i mean a lot of the pictures i saw where people were looking at calendar one in the snow that's true <laughs> but the but the rock mounds and stuff would yeah, be, yeah 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 uh, a little more difficult but well, yeah I, we can ask them so yeah yeah look up uh cheng shin how do you spell that c-h-e-n-g all right, C H A N G H S I N. Yeah, that's where Brendan works. Yeah, you can definitely get a hold of Brendan through Cheng Shin, <clears throat> and then he can put you in touch with Sarah. Yeah, he's a uh, Brendan is um, he does martial arts and and um, all kinds of cool stuff like that. Yeah, at Cheng Shin. Yeah, great guy to have you with with you in the woods. That's right. Keep you from going four one one. Just leave him behind to do the fighting, and you can run. <laughs> Uh, okay, this is a comment from the website on episode 130 with Christopher Dunn. It's Brandon, he says, Brilliant! I nearly fell off my ladder laughing when you said, The other Scablands. <laughs> <laughs> Found myself chuckling aloud at several points, really, but hilarity aside, it was a real treat to hear from the man himself and Robert and Eric after the rest of the episodes on Chris's book. So much great information, so much to think about and wonder at. Thanks for another great episode, y'all. Snakes! Yeah, thanks, yeah. Brandon. Appreciate that. Uh, we're almost done here. Uh, Levi says, 1.30 is awesome. Listen twice the day it came out. Keep up the snake work. Thanks, Levi. Appreciate that. Yeah, buddy. Tommy says, for 1.30, snakes alive, the internet broke today. <laughs> Pyramid resonant echoes still ring in my head. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I thought all the previous three shows pretty much capped y'all, all of y'all have done. Then comes number 130, Sheesh. I've been following this for more than a decade along with Graham Hancock, Gobekli Tepe, Brian Forster and the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis. 
Could Mark, Martin Sweatman be topped with a million in possible block pyramid? He can be. All the posts on Graham Hancock's message board concerning Giza and the Great Pyramid will need to be moved out of the mystery heading into their own category. Cheers. Oh, and let me put for, uh, funds forward towards the pyramid scheme so another impossible block may be erected in your honor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you so much yeah, for that. Appreciate that, Tommy. And Brandon, too. But yeah, Tommy. Boom. Oh, wow. He deserves commander <laughs> status. <laughs> commander status. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> okay, this is from The Grand Watcher. He says, wow, number 130. Absolutely amazing. So many things came together. Get him back on soon. And we should, because there's so much more to talk about. Okay, there's still a few more, but uh, we'll save these for the next show. We've already gone really long here. And we got a couple of one-up boxes to open. Yeah, keep it going. 40 minutes in already. Yeah. Get these open. Uh, I can just pause it and open both of them. <laughs> no, no, no! You gotta have the actual unboxing on the show. Yeah. This is like a, this is like a big thing. This has got to be from Brandon. It's cube shaped. Yeah, yes. This is the brand. This is Brandon. <laughs> Whoa, Sammy. Yeah. The other one is from Matt. Oh. Yeah, weighs a ton. How much does this cost to ship? <laughs> oh God! <laughs> Whatever's in there has it's totally gotta damaged. Be a, it's got to be a rock. I know. It's totally damaged that side of the box. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon says this is our Christmas present stuff. Oh, okay. It says snakes. Merry Christmas, Russ and Kyle. Thanks for all you do to help grow the community and to help so many have a voice in the conversation, even as liberal. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing you need to understand about Brandon is Brandon's a liberal. <laughs> Sorry for the late Christmas presents. Uh, hopefully these will help you get to not glad in your outings. My father and I made these for you guys. Enjoy. Brandon Ricks, History Shift. Awesome. Yeah. This is going to help us not glad. Oh. Oh, hey. they're, one, they're wrapped. Oh, oh. Man, how... how have we not been checking the mail or what? <laughs> Christmas present? Well, he said it was a late. Oh, okay. Thing, yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. Oh, wow. What is this? How is this going to help me? Okay, not I'm pretty sure this thing can break some glass. Yeah. <laughs> Go to youtube and watch this video for how to use your new survival pin it's a survival pin okay very cool oh okay it does, does some okay, stuff so it unscrews there's the pin part yeah man this thing's hardcore and that I looks know, like, like bone or antler yeah so they make these i guess so he said they, they made them wow man this yeah is there's awesome. like all these little yeah it's parts. like a it's like a multi-tool. Okay, this has got to be a piece of flint or something for starting a fire. Yeah. Or um, magnesium or something. This is cool. Thanks, Brandon. Yeah, dude, these, these are, really are awesome. awesome. Yeah, let's stick these in my survival bag. And there's like a little snake on it. Yeah, what's so, in the... Oh, this is the... Is that's the lint, lint to, start the fire? to start a fire. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I do have my own lint. So. All right, Brandon. Appreciate it. Where did this lint come from? <laughs> <laughs> Did a load of the whites. Gave us some of the lint. <laughs> uh, thanks, buddy. Yeah, this is it. awesome. Yeah. All right. A load of the whites. <laughs> All right. Second box. Second box. From Matt. Yeah. What's who up, we dude? have who we have already doxed, he says. He's like, you guys already doxed. Oh, we already doxed him. Mega yeah. Man Matt. <laughs> says, snakes, here's an old, worn-out copper chisel <laughs> for the cube. What? Oh, my God. Oh, is it a, is it a, a drill bit? That's why it's so freaking heavy. Because Matt, Matt, uh, what are you talking Matt about? makes holes. It's a drill bit. I'm just guessing. I haven't opened it yet, but I'm guessing it's a freaking bit for drilling well, uh, oil wells. Oh, a worn out copper chisel. Yeah. 
<laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Man, that is awesome. <laughs> 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 it sure is a yeah, copper it chisel. It's a giant, you know, it's the multi bitted, I don't know what they're called, the teeth. You put on the very end and then you, like, as he says, you put make, it on the drill stand yeah, pipe. You, and then you're making holes, is what he calls it. Making holes. Making holes. So this is a, a <laughs> oil well drill bit. That's really freaking awesome. Thanks, man. That is cool. Copper chisel. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> For the cube. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. It must have cost you a fortune to ship that thing. I know. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks so much. We will be back for a quick uh, update from the Tusk. That's right. Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And we have a special guest with us, a return guest, George Howard, from out there, uh, parts unknown, in the Carolina area. So, how you doing, George? What's up? Doing good, Russ and Kyle. Thanks a lot for having me on. It's good to see you fellas. I've been listening and enjoying the recent uh, shows and, and looking forward to more. Ah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah. So yeah, we got you on here because uh, we wanted to we wanted uh, to give our listeners an update on what's going on with the bib and yeah. the hoopla surrounding the bib. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I tell you, only in this area of research could something so uncontroversial and anodyne as a bibliography <laughs> be taken with umbrage <laughs> by well-educated credentialed scientists. I mean, a, a bibliography as you just referred to the bib is which I call it on the cosmic tusk, my yeah. blog on the subject, you know, a bibliography is a, 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 a pretty, uh, you know, uh, oatmeal and apple pie kind of thing, you know, I mean, it is what it is and they don't tend to reflect any particular bias. I never think of that and I don't look for them for bias and a professor at the university of Kansas, a well-schooled gentleman that went to Harvard and Yale, <clears throat> Uh, but it's been at Kansas for some 30 years now. Uh, he had a problem with our bibliography and started trolling us on Tusk, uh, on the, on, or excuse me, started trolling us on Twitter. Uh, me and the, the co-author of the bibliography that we keep at the cosmic Tusk. And it, it was, uh, I think kind of shameful, you know, there's certainly worse things on Twitter. It didn't devolve into, you know, curse words and that kind of stuff, which a lot of stuff does on Twitter. But taken from the perspective of uh, the gentleman being a, an established um, academic, John Hoops is his name, to go on Twitter and come after two fellows who had just developed a, a, a concise bibliography on a particular subject uh, for it being biased, I thought was surprising and kind of disappointing. And he's also factually incorrect, and that was obvious. That's why I called it in my in the post I did on it that it, it was a troll effort. Yeah, you know, it's where you're trying to bait people into either saying something dumb or getting mad or otherwise knock them, uh, you know, off of their uh, position um, by pestering them. And that's what he did. And, I, you know, to make it even worse, as soon as I got in, I made one comment to the fellow, we can go into that, but then he blocks me. Oh. Yeah, so, he blocks yeah, you. So he's, yeah, criticizing a bibliography, every tweet's being copied to two of the bibliography authors. I make one statement in it, and he blocks me, <laughs> but he continues to talk about me and talk about my work product, but doesn't accept any, of course, know, any response, or not any allowed response. to respond. Yeah. Shut up, That's slave. Right. <laughs> That's right. He yeah. did keep my working partner on this, the indefatigable Mark Young of Adelaide, Australia. He did stay in communication with him and the entire exchange is on the cosmic tusk. Um, Mark used some kind of nice little Twitter app or, or some kind of application that, that, that managed to capture in one big image, the entire conversation, which I felt found was helpful. But what he says, what his contention is, 
is that the 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 bibliography we developed is biased uh, by not including older material, which uh, is suspected by some to be related to the cosmic impact that we define being 12,800 years ago, what we call the Younger Dryas impact. And the bibliography, as Mark and I defined it, which I think was a very fair definition, was to be on all published research concerning the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, which has been peer-reviewed and is in standard or major journals. I mean, that's, you know, pretty run-of-the-mill stuff in any kind of academic or archival or referencing effort. Yeah. To but, say, yeah. But who was c claiming that that um, the material, quote-unquote, left out is yeah. uh, contextual material? Now, that's is that, right. Is that typical in in – in a bibliography to include contextual material, even if it was just some guy randomly saying, I bet such and such happened <laughs> 50 years ago. Well, he wasn't quite that bad. He gave some examples of what he thought should be included. And that included uh, the writings of Plato, uh, William Whiston, who was a associate uh, of, um, of uh, Newton, and also got to modern times and said that, that some of the speculative books, in particular one published by some of the lead co-authors before they uh, wrote a journal paper in 2005, they published a, 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 a book called The Cycle of Cosmic Catastrophes, and he, he insisted that be included. But I know for a fact, as someone who developed the bibliography, that didn't cross our mind uh, once. And it's not that it didn't cross our mind because we thought it might hurt the uh, hurt the bibliography. It's just it, it, it wasn't included in that set that we were trying to capture. And that set that we were trying to capture is all published peer review papers since the original paper announcing the discovery of impact proxies at the Younger Dryas Boundary. And there have been 190 of them now. So that's already a fairly large set. It's fairly complex. But you know that each of those papers is going to formally cite, reference, discuss, perhaps refute, perhaps support but it's going to all be a result of that first paper. And that's, it's kind of funny, you know, they call those original papers. It's almost, uh, uh, you know, probably an overused term, but uh, the, uh, seminal, seminal papers. Yeah. Right. yeah. And if people don't know, it's kind of, you know, a little funny, of course, the, the, the reference there does the same root word as semen that you have inseminated <laughs> a discussion. That's why it's okay, called yeah. seminal. Huh. Got it. Yeah. And it's a dramatic moment of a beginning. And then many, many things come from that. It is seminal. Right. It's the good starting point. So we picked the seminal paper just as you would of Alvarez and uh, uh, Lewis and Walter Alvarez publishing in 1980 on the, the uh, KT boundary and the extinction of the dinosaurs due to an impact. I've seen bibliography after bibliography that starts with that paper and goes on to everything that was to come for it. Were they the first person to suggest that a comic killed the dinosaurs? It may seem that way because they're given credit for proving it, which is well-deserved. But no, they certainly weren't the first people to suggest that. Right. So, And let's be clear, the, bibli the bibliography you guys have put together is not yeah. only positive. You have papers That's that are— That's right. Yeah, so you've, got, you've included papers that cite all the works that are critical or that cite all the works that are, like, indifferent. That's right. Right? So it isn't like yeah. you've put together a completely biased, where, like, here's all the positive papers and none of the, none of the attempts at refutation, none of the attempts at questions— You've got it. That's right. And, yeah. and we have no, particularly at the Cosmic Tusk, I have no problem taking a strong position and, and discussing things that, uh, you know, aren't so quantifiable and taking a position, you know, on the, the, the truth or falsity of the critics and, and the weak spots in our argument and all of that. But that wasn't what we were trying to do. We were trying to show every single thing that has been published about the subject since the seminal paper, and we did a great job of it, and it never occurred to us that somebody could have a problem with it. In fact, I kind of thought that it would be the kind of thing that the critics themselves would welcome, and I'm sure there's some like that because it's a utilitarian tool. It's intended the bibliography. By the way, folks, if you go to it at the Cosmic Tusk and go to the upper right drop-down menu, it's the first thing there, just two clicks away from the Cosmic Tusk. And it, not only does it show you everything that's been published, but but we provide a copy of every paper. That's right. And yeah. that's very, very unusual. Yeah. And that's all obtained within a click. So that's really helpful to somebody that wants to go see how this has been playing out. And I think it would be equally helpful regardless of your position on it. 
but I, I think ultimately what you see there with uh, uh, hoops is not a sincere criticism. Uh, it's trolling, and it's also a naked exercise in goalpost moving. Yeah. Because anybody that's been interested in catastrophic subjects or, frankly, any controversial um, scientific subject has experienced, probably with some justification, academics and other mainstream types come back and tell them, don't come to us and discuss this, this kooky idea until you have your peer-reviewed papers in hand. You know, there are a lot of things out there that, that, that suffer outside of peer review and get dismissed because they aren't able to get published because it's too astounding. And this is a subject that actually overcame that barrier, which yes. can be rare. You don't see, and I do not believe in homeopathy, but let's just say it's homeopathy. You don't see peer-reviewed papers on homeopathy. And people who believe homeopathy, homeopathy is a legitimate medical practice, God bless them. They're probably told, come back when you get it in the Journal of American Medicine, yeah. right? Right. And the, 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 there's something to that. Now, maybe it turns out homeopathy is true, and they've been sidelined all these years. That creates another problem. But for our um, for our subject, there was a tremendous catastrophe, you know, just short of 13,000 years ago. Uh, um, we got it into the major journals right off the bat. Other people have attempted that with other approaches to catastrophism, and it didn't work. But our, our evidence was so good that we were able to have it published time and time again in top journals, uh, particularly the proceedings of the National Academy of Science. They then to say, oh, don't give me your peer-reviewed papers. That should have been the end of the thing there, that we should have been able to speak to Mr. Hoops or, or, or present our information to Mr. Hoops and others like him and say, let's discuss this peer-reviewed work because I know you only think, take things uh, seriously that are peer-reviewed. Well, what does he respond? I want you to include a lot of things that aren't peer reviewed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's goalpost moving. Yes. And it actually moves the goalpost to a place of less scientific certainty, which is usually not where people mm -hmm. like hoops want to go. But he wants you to throw the kitchen sink in and every reference to a flood or a catastrophe in the past and every kooky book that was written about Atlantis, maybe some truth to it, who knows. But uh, you're not going to put all the Atlantis books in a bibliography about the younger Dryas impact hypothesis, yeah. which is clearly defined and clearly begun the discussion uh, yeah. in that uh, uh, in that 2007. Yeah, and that's and that's a title of a theory. Yeah, or a hypothesis. Excuse me. Yeah, the younger right. Dryas impact hypothesis is a title, and so the bibliography it, is on that subject. Not that's an excellent point. Yeah. yeah. No one would say that William Whiston or Plato, Plato, a longtime advocate of the Younger Dryas Impact <laughs> Hypothesis. An independent worker, yeah. An independent worker, <laughs> Velikovsky, who never mentioned the term, but believed the Younger Dryas Impact was, you yeah. know, critical to our history. You know, I mean. Yeah. He just uh, wants he just wants more opportunities to build straw men. That's what it seems like. That's to me. exactly right. And it's it's so beneath somebody of that education. But you know, when I looked into the guy and I I guess this is an ad hominem. It's supposed to be the way that you rank scholarship, but he's very poorly published when you look at it. There's not a whole lot of action out there from Hoops. Okay. And uh, certainly nothing that, that was groundbreaking. I don't think he's ever, you know, stepped out on uh, uh, any planks before and, and taken the kind of risk that we're taking in this publication. He should have more respect for people that do take risks. He's, a, he's an anthropologist. Is that right? He is an anthropologist. Yeah, okay. And when he blocked me, and maybe it was a little snarky, but he was already well into the the dispute with uh, uh, Mark Young, and Mark was, you know, uh, very gently and I think appropriately trying to explain to him, obviously frustrated, what we were seeking to do in the bibliography. And then I stepped in, like I said, and and, and joined the conversation. And again, it might have been a little snarky, but I couldn't help myself. I, <laughs> I said, John, John, one of the original authors and been with part of the Younger Dry's Impact publishing team since the very beginning is a tremendous guy and a, a, a emeritus professor at your very own university, Adrian Malo, right, who's an astrophysicist. Okay, well, John, if you're going to spend a lot of time on Twitter, you know, shooting down this theory as pseudo-archaeology or somehow intertwined with pseudo-archaeology so intimately that it can't be taken seriously, then just do us the, you know, favor of going and speaking to your, you know, colleague at the University of Kansas and ask him whether he's involved in a pseudoscientific effort. Yeah. Mm. And he did. No, he didn't. He's a respectable academic like you're supposed to be. This isn't pseudoscience. It might be disputable science. It might be incorrect science. Blocked. But it's not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, boom, there you go. Yeah. Uh, that's right. It didn't even get, and then blocked. And he continues to talk about my work and, and, and copy me. You know how you are on Twitter. I'm one of the people on the thread. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it, it's terrible. I, I should note the thread began with a tweet by Graham Hancock. And then it was embedded in all of that. And I'm sure that set hoops off. Probably. Uh, you know, the, yeah. Uh, right. That, that Hancock, I, I guess, was, you know, I know he has in the past uh, complimented the bibliography, but I don't even think that's exactly how it began. I'm looking over there now. Um, see what his original but, tweet so was. So yeah. one, one of the things that was happening, too, was he was trying to point to, he's like, look at this Wikipedia page. Yes. This is actually. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. So to explain that, because that was just ridiculous as well. Well, he 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 said kind of interrupted the conversation with uh, I guess he thought it was a good shot, but he said, uh, "Oh gosh, uh, uh, well actually it was in the original tweet. The full bibliography on Cosmic Tusk is clearly biased towards the conclusion of the site's contributors, which would be me and I guess Mark. The bibliography of this article represents a great deal more balance." And then he gives the you know always shifting. No Wikipedia article on a co controversial subject, w which I think is a bad reference. I, don't, I just can't believe academics do that. Everybody should read Wikipedia, you know, and that's part of everyone's research was oftentimes the first thing, but I don't cite it as a bibliography for God's sake. Right. But it turns out that Hoops is the principal author of the, of the Wikipedia article, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. So yeah. how circular is that? Yeah. Here, here's really where you should go. In other words, me. Yeah. And to not reveal that, I mean, it'd be so easy to say this Bibli article, the 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 Wikipedia Wikipedia article to which I contributed substantially, I believe represents more balance. Yeah, right. but he doesn't. He but doesn't that's say not that. the way it's yeah. done. Yeah. That's exactly right. He's hiding behind the anonymity of Wikipedia, or at least try, you know, like hoping yeah. no one finds out. Yeah. It's just I mean, Wikipedia. What it's a not a weenie. Hoops. Yeah. What a weenie. I mean, you just can't get any more weenie than that. I'm going to yeah. sit in the dark and edit Wikipedia articles, then go knock other people who clearly and publicly themselves, you know, do an archival effort. Yeah. And say mine's better, but not reveal that it's mine. I mean, exactly. Don't get any worse. Yeah. Yeah. Underhanded so. all the way around. So it's disappointing. And I hope the people that, that do follow this subject and, you know, God knows might follow some of the stuff I say about it. They could probably, you know, get upset because we're getting so jaded and frustrated with this stuff. I hope it doesn't take away from people's interest because the folks that get close to it end up getting very, very frustrated with the treatment that you get and the goalpost moving and the double standards that are so clearly infect this whole debate. Yeah. Well, the yeah. snake force is very familiar with the actions of script hearts. So don't that's worry about right. that. Yeah, right. Okay. That's <laughs> right. You're thinking you, the snake force can handle a script art. In fact, they, they, they love it. Don't yeah. They? Yeah. Like, ah, that's right. more script gotta, derping from the script art. That's right. That's right. Well, that's a great role to play because it needs some, yeah. you know, particularly in defense of published peer reviewed science for gosh sakes. I mean, yeah. nobody's talking ancient aliens here and that's where the, you know, it's where they, and, uh, but there shouldn't be anything wrong with that either. Yeah. Wait a minute. I'm pretty sure you guys are talking about ancient aliens. I've, I've seen some of the stuff mm -hmm. written in there. It's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, or maybe or extraterrestrial maybe have... impact a really long time ago. Come on. Guys. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or may, 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 maybe we're just, we, the whole younger drives team, the 70 or so people worldwide who've been working on this from dozens of different disciplines are all harboring a desire to get down to, you know, uh, to proving ancient aliens, we're just working our way through it very, very slowly. Right. <laughs> this is very and sinister. We're going to prove the <laughs> catastrophe, and then we're going to prove somehow that there's a UFO under some of the, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. debris from the comet or something. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. But, 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 but they throw it all in together. There's something there. It's true that the people who believe in the fringiest of fringe theories are going to find some excitement, some support, if you will, from the younger dry impact hypothesis and good on them. Yeah. But it only goes as far as it goes. And it goes as far as I go with it is that there was a catastrophe perceived, you know, uh, precursor civilizations, which is where Graham H Hancock does so much good work. Um, that's interesting, but it's not going to be proven by the techniques that we're using. Right. So there's no interest on our part to get into that. The, we believe there was a catastrophe. If that helps, you know, support, you know, uh, uh, theories that have less evidence in support of their, 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 their real premise, you know, so be it. But we can't be responsible for that.
Right. And people just need to relax a little. Um, I'll also know, talk about us harboring certain kinds of bias. He says at the end of the thing that this kind of got to me, but I was blocked, so not much I could say about it. <laughs> but nor could I see it, actually, for a while, you know, yeah. because you can't go see what people say. And he brings my name up. How about somebody that'll bring your name up? After, and they've, after they've blocked after you. After they blocked you. Yeah. Hold on. Where is he? Get, he basically says, you um, Mm -mm. he kind of accuses me of being a bible beater and harboring not uh, there it is uh <clears throat> it'll be interesting genesis stories i don't know why you say probably atheist because mark is saying that listen th these guys are not trying to prove noah's flood and we don't need to include references to everybody in the past who have sought to prove noah's flood because that's not what they're doing here yeah so he says um <clears throat> Uh, the scientists who are not religious zealots uh, preaching of Noah's flood. These people are scientists, probably atheists and leaders in their respective field. And there probably are some atheists. I mean, you get a good group of science together, you're going to have some atheists, yeah. just like any group. And then Hoops responds, I don't know why you say probably atheist. Several YDIH researchers have degrees from religious colleges and or seminaries. George Howard refers to related research in biblical, biblical archaeology. You don't have to be a religious zealot to be influenced by interest in Genesis stories. Well, that's just uh, offensive on a lot of levels, <laughs> man. I mean, he doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. He's actually trying to deduce my spirituality or religious preferences. I mean, and then saying it is infecting. And you're damn right I went on a biblical archaeology dig. And the, the people scared the hell out of me. They weren't afraid of us getting attacked by terrorists because they thought the Bible was going to protect us. <laughs> I'm like, hell, jeez, people. God, I bless. I loved everybody I went on the dig. I went on, you know, five weeks of it over two um, years in 2014 and 15. It was one of the greatest experiences of my life. But I am not a fundamentalist Christian. You know, and it had zero influence in the dig. You know, it's also thank God he didn't put their name in or go after them directly because I can't imagine you have to walk a very delicate balance to be a archaeologist using the best techniques, the best approaches, and having legitimate publishable archaeological evidence over 15 seasons they've been digging out there and be a person of faith but not let that infect the science and the evidence. Yeah. And this is for Tel Al Hamam. I'm sorry, I should have given some background. I don't mean to go on long about it, but we're, we're digging over there <clears throat> for the lost city of Sodom. Oh, and yeah. a wonderful, wonderful man, Dr. Stephen Collins um, from uh, uh, Trinity University, uh, thought that he could reverse engineer some of the geography, not, not the religious content, but the geography of Genesis, and uh, without going too deeply into it, I've got a great YouTube video where he gives the whole story that I think has got a lot of hits these days. And, and, but, but Collins actually went and found a cultural tell or tall that had not been investigated yet based off of some clues within Genesis and said, not only are, you know, is there a, 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 a city that absolutely matches the descriptions in the Bible in many different ways, but the biblical archaeologists were wrong. Yeah. All the sawdust kickers through the years, the first people he had to offend were the zealots ah. and the lightly informed, you know, biblical truth people and the apologists that had said for close to a century that Sodom was south of the Dead Sea. And he said, uh, you know, that's faith. That ain't fact. Here's yeah. fact. It'd be north of the Dead Sea because they describe it as a well-watered area like Egypt, which is the Jordan Valley, et cetera, and so forth. Long story short, he finds a, a former gun emplacement that had never been properly looked at for good reasons because it was highly mined and used as a gun emplacement in the Jordan Valley. But that stuff had been cleared off, fortunately, right before he did his first you know, surface collection, and he discovered the largest city in the Levant. No one disputes that. Wow. And then the indication that it perhaps could be Sodom is that you go two meters down and there's a burn layer and a, a sterile layer for another 700 years. Something went, wow. you know, wow, there was a yeah. horrendous fire. And I'm sorry, guys, you do a whole podcast just on Tell All Mom, That's, and I recommend you do. Oh, That's wow, awesome. yeah. And yeah, double long story short, um, <laughs> somebody got in touch with me and, and, and suggested that uh, the Comet Research Group, with their great forensic tools, which 
I am not skilled in, but I was the intermediary, said that, that, that could y'all take a look at this? Yeah. That you've got ways to determine through soil morphology and geochemistry, you know, that, that some things in spirits, high heat and hellish conditions and whatnot. Could you take a look at this? So I flew over there one year and then the next year brought several other people from the CRG. And these are all people that had absolutely no religious inclinations to go on the visit. You know, that wasn't what we were doing. We were trying to provide those people of faith absolute rock hard forensic support for their hypothesis that the book might have been telling us something true. Yeah. Which um, could well be whether, you know, um, you know, whether a lot of the religious aspects of the Old Testament are not true, you could still have stories that were related. Right. And made, made it down to us. And indeed, we did find uh, a tremendous platinum peak at that same level. And that's wow. going to be published. I can't say a whole lot more or shouldn't say and don't know a whole lot more, but that's going to be well published uh, probably uh, earlier rather than later this year uh, cool. in a big journal. That yes. kind of reminds me of the story of the guy finding Troy. They yeah. all, they're all yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah, it's yeah. a fictional city. It's not real. That whole story Sweet was fictional. Man. Yeah, and then he finds Troy. He's like, no, here it is, right? That's a <laughs> perfect analogy to yeah. this. And um, I just recommend it as anybody that's interested in the, the general uh, uh, – subject area of catastrophe during historical or you know just prehistorical times look into tell al Imam and the search for sodom and the there's a great book out on it and and they've really found something there and yeah. they found gomorrah too you can see gomorrah from there so uh hoops went to yale right yeah yeah so yale university had its beginnings with the founding of the new haven colony in 1638 by a band of 500 puritans who fled yeah. from England. It was the dream of Reverend John Davenport, the religious leader of the colony, to establish a theocracy and to educate its leaders. Hoops. Ah, <laughs> I bet you some of your <laughs> early anthropologists were great men of faith, too. Yeah, I'm and just I'm, pointing out, like, if you want to start yeah. pointing fingers yeah. at people coming from religious schools, well, yeah. there you go, Yale. Yeah. It was started to educate leaders of a theocracy. Hoops, get out of here with your religious accusations. That's all I'm saying. I, I w <laughs> you almost wishes I wish his charge was true. I wish I was a better man of faith. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I wish I had a strong enough faith to walk into it believing that. I was a huge skeptic on this. I still <laughs> remain. I'm one of the bigger, you know, we got to be careful here about Tel El Imam, you know? Yeah. Um, but but the platinum evidence was so strong that um, I found a rock that ended up being very important. That is going to be a centerpiece of the thing that clearly endured, you know, 3000 degrees C Wow! on one side. That's really cool. Hmm. Yeah, it is. It's a beautiful place, man. It's a, it's an incredible thing. And I recommend people look into it. It sits there in the Jordan Valley and you can see it. What it was, was the mirror city to Jericho. Jericho is to Jerusalem, the city down in the Valley to the capital up on the Hill. Right. Yeah. If you go to the other side of the Jordan River and the uh, Dead Sea Valley, Tel Al Imam sits at the bottom of the hill, two thousand feet below, just like Jericho does to Jerusalem to Amman, the oh, okay. capital of Jordan. So it was the winter palace for the king. You know, they would come from the hills and come down into the valley, just like they did on the other side of the river at Jericho. And they're both, you know, eight, nine, ten thousand years old. Wow. But no one had ever found the other city. Because, you know, it was, you know, had landmines all over it during most of the period since archaeology has been invented. Uh, okay. Makes it the last wow. place you check. Yeah. Sorry to go on about that. So no, long. that's no, awesome, that's man. Really that's, cool. I didn't know yeah. that whole part of the story. That's you heard it here first, folks. That's right. Breaking, Breaking news. news. <laughs> I tell you, we'll give kid, you know, uh, Hoops, give Hoops credit. He's following along. If he knew about the Tell Mom work, I mean, he f refers to it elliptically, but but he is following along. Yeah. I just w wish he didn't, you know, resent my involvement in a, you know, a, a biblical matter. Well, right. he's just trying to say you're biased, man. Yeah. It's just another that's straw right. man to stand up to. <laughs> for him to beat up like well let, let's investigate that a little bit i am biased yeah i'm biased as hell that's <laughs> one of the great things about being a non-credentialed avocational scientist you can have all the bias you want <laughs> i think we're right and they're all wrong yeah and we're good and they're bad <laughs> yeah you know? all of that i'm biased but when you go and put together a bibliography for god's sake you don't say well let's see how he can skew this thing for the good guys yeah you know, I mean, that's no fun. You what? What happens if you have a weak bibliography? You just don't do a bibliography. Okay. <laughs> that makes the other sense. side has twenty papers, and you got two papers. You know. Yeah. But but when you look at our bibliography in a totally uh, 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 
you know, non-biased sense, um, it's actually very, very good for our story. It's clear that there's a lot more research indicating this, strong research indicating something happened compared to uh, less weak research saying it didn't happen. Yeah. So it's very impressive standalone, and it didn't require any bias to, to, to obviously get his attention. Um, again, you know, these things are all backhanded compliments. He must think it's very effective, the bibliography put together. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, let's, uh, that was, that's a good overview of that whole situation. But let's, I got a question here from a member of the Snake Force. And they just want yeah. you to, they want you to basically give a, a brief explanation for why the Carolina Bays are different in shape than like a standard cosmic crater. Right, right. That's a great question. Yeah. And that's one that the critics of the ET theory of Carolina Bays um, uh, kind of uh, abuse, uh, and, I, and I think sometimes willfully, because they'll say, well, it's very well defined what a cosmic impact crater looks like. It has these parameters and it's going to have this width to depth ratio. It's going to be this deep to this wide, and it's going to generally be circular, blah, 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 blah. All absolutely true, but no one's saying it's an impact crater, right? <laughs> it's a secondary feature of something that happened somewhere else. Right. It's yeah. like saying a, 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 a blood spatter pattern is a wound. No, uh. the wound is elsewhere. It does have a certain nature to it and it is bloody. <laughs> but over here is where it, you know, if you will, yeah. sp sprayed some blood out. And this yeah. is a secondary feature. So that might have. Yeah, that's a great analogy, I think. Yeah. OK, good, good, yeah. good. That is a good because uh, because it, it was a little gross. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But 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 yeah. What and 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 without going all into it, I remain a little bit agnostic on the Carolina Bays, despite being the person whose name is most associated with them. I think it is very much an unknown either way. My general you know take is that I do not accept the current formation theories of the other side. So I have to leave the ET hypothesis is going to be open till somebody closes that door for 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 me as a personal matter yeah uh in a better manner than they have now and we could get into the details of that but just back to the initial question is people will say to you well the carolina bays clearly aren't craters and you gotta not as roughly as i did a moment ago but just say they're actually their they're secondary features is what's been claimed since at least 1970 so the original uh, uh, defenders or the, the people like uh, William Prouty, who was chair of the geology department at UNC, where I went to college, he died in, I think it was about 1954. He spent the last 20 years of his career as chair of the department of geology, saying that all of these features happened at once at the same time. And when they were publishing all that work, and they had just a huge imbroglio, you know, uh, scientific back and forth and, 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 and paper war, ET or non-ET, they were very weakened by the fact that, yeah, they do not appear to be primary impact craters for a variety of reasons. And they couldn't step away from that right away, right? You kind of do get stuck that you're on the right track. Something happened all at once to create these. That's yeah. the only thing that it could explain this, that, and the other. But it, it wasn't what they thought. It must be some kind of different crater that something hit each place there's a Carolina Bay had something from space land in it at high speed. That didn't turn out to be true. By the 1970s, people were starting to speculate, you know, to the degree that the hypothesis was still, you know, had a heart beating, that, that uh, you know, it still looks like this all happened at once in a short period of time, and it has some unifying mechanism to it. Um, perhaps these are secondary features. And uh, I actually did it on that show. Uh, oh, gosh with all the satellite stuff, I went on TV, uh, out of this world. I forget what it's called, but I've seen it recreated a couple of times and I did it once on TV too, where you throw a rock into a mud puddle and everything goes shooting out, you know, the mud splatters out yeah, and then it lands somewhere and it looks like something. Yeah. Okay. That's what we're saying happened that it was the secondary ejecta from an impact somewhere, probably in the Midwest, perhaps into the ice sheet itself could have created Saginaw Bay as some people think. Yep. So let's just take the Saginaw Bay hypothesis that it created Saginaw Bay. If you line it up, that actually creates a very nice butterfly pattern fit for 
what they know to be the blast wave and secondary ejecta pattern for an impact at one place, that it's going to fly out in almost a butterfly fashion, and that matches up perfectly with the Carolina Bays and the Carolinas and the eastern seaboard, but also the Nebraska and Kansas family of bays that you never hear anybody talk about. Right. Because it makes it very, very difficult to say that they would be orienting themselves uh, while conspiring with their Carolina brothers, you know, 1,200 miles away, and that somehow <laughs> the wind was so consistent over 100,000 years, because they'll – the, the, the standing mainstream theory is the bays were formed over 100,000 years in, in three different phases, which I think is silly because, it, but, but okay, they, they say having a, they wouldn't go and continue to orient themselves with their brothers thousands of miles away when it, the phenomena happened, died away, came back, the mysterious yeah. wind that blows lakes into perfect ogles, returns, <laughs> creates another class of lakes, goes away for 12, 15, 20,000 years, and it returns again yeah. and creates more Carolina bays. And you wouldn't be able to go back and look at the bays. I think if that were true, you'd be able to say, well, here's bay class A, here's bay class B, and here's C. And you could see, yeah, they all, it's the same phenomena happened, but each time the wind was a little bit different, you would assume, why would the wind go away and come back up with exactly the same uh, dynamic and energy contribution to the landscape where the, all the ovals would point the same direction again? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. You're talking about that. I mean, that's. That standard yeah. standard model idea is that the complex theory, the Artesian Aeolian Lacustrian. The Artesian Lacustrian Aeolian theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It had to include half a geography textbook just to explain <laughs> their yeah. their tor tortured tortured approach to this. Yeah, and some of the some of these folks, you know, as you all know, and probably some of the um, Snake Force knows is that some of these folks that highly criticize that to trust formal process are some of my best scientific buddies. Yeah. Right. And they're parts of our team that are trying to prove it. So it's very, very controversial to, to them, uh, some more than others. But I think it irritates probably all of them to some degree that take that position. There are other members, very senior members, that, that don't talk about it much, but still believe the Carolina Bays are inadequately explained. Yeah. But we try to keep it out of the younger, driest talk because it's just, if it's evidence, it's really the poorest evidence there is. It might be the most interesting or sexy. Yeah. But it's not something you're going you're gonna to cause yourself more trouble digging into the bays when trying to prove the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. You're just causing yourself trouble doing it. Yeah. But it remains a fascinating, fascinating subject. Yeah, but I, so, I, I would definitely say that, like, it's too bad that they, that they can't be connected directly because in terms of just the general public, you show a picture of them and people are like, what the hell? Whereas it's difficult to do that with impact proxies and nano diamonds and little black layers and, and yeah, that's true, right? But you show a picture it of the, of the, of the bays and people are like, "Holy crap, what is that?" Right? So it's too bad that they can't be more strongly connected. Hopefully that'll happen. Well, in the they, they still are there. They're yeah. still in the original research. They're not provided as evidence now. But you know, it ain't over yet either. That's right. Right. You know, if you can get to it from the other ways, because bays are dismissed so completely it, it, it's not helpful but i think as the the hypothesis becomes more widely accepted in the mainstream community maybe they'll give the bays another look yeah um and of course we did recently i mean just with our little group we went out and dug one up this summer and i was just emailing with chris cottrell we're going to send off the uh the sediment samples for platinum testing here in the next couple of weeks yeah all right excited yeah. to hear about that yeah, 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 we yeah. should and get. I mean, uh, that's redneck science for sure. <laughs> okay. It'll be a long, long trip to the publisher for that paper. But, <laughs> but me and Chris are going to give it a run. All right, good deal. I was, yeah. uh, I was thinking, you know, we should try to get Hoop to uh, to go go for the bays because it'd be a perfect acronym, right? Hoop. Oh, the Carolina Bays. <laughs> bunch of yeah. bunch of hoops. Yeah, yeah, a bunch of. Well, I tell you what, we, we might as well start doing it just to get his goat, you know, because you know a guy like that. If you started hitting him with Bay info, would absolutely just go shrill and hysterical. Yeah, you know, and and half the fun. Snake of the Force stuff, engage. Making those jackasses go shrill and hysterical, and it's easy, man. Yeah, it is. You know, and and uh, let me finish up a little bit with the Bays and give credit to Antonio Zamora because. This has gotten back in the literature, both through the tangential evidence associated with the Younger Dryas impact, but but then directly Antonio Zamora, who, who people may have seen his, seen his work on YouTube, 
did get something published in the Journal of uh, Geomorphology, very appropriate journal, that, that you know, gave his um, uh, elliptical theory, that they're all such perfect ellipses that it is obviously a cone of pressure of some sort passing through the soil and leaving an ellipse. So if you pass a, a cone like a dunce caps, you know, yeah. dunce's cap, and pass it through, and you guys know this, just to repeat for some listeners if they don't, if you pass it at an angle through a level ground surface, you end up with a perfect ellipse. Yeah. And he said that that is too coincidental to happen, you know, 50,000 times, that there had to be an elliptical or had to be a, 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 a conical, a, 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 excuse me, conical, exactly, a conical form of pressure passing through it. So what does that mean in the real world? What happened was the punchline. He says impact into Saginaw Bay casts up uh, uh, a mix, but largely gigantic. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually tough to verbalize because it does sound so crazy, but let's say it. Gigantic hypersonic glacial icebergs up into the lower atmosphere and while they're traveling to the Carolinas and elsewhere, after being kicked out of Saginaw Bay and the ice there, that an M, the earthquake from such a horrendous, horrendous uh, event like that would have reached the coastal plain in the Carolinas and the soils out in, in Kansas and Nebraska, the sands out there, it would have reached them before the hypersonic icebergs landed. And it would have liquefied the ground, which is a very well understood phenomenon that when you have a very shallow uh, water table, which is, I wouldn't be in the wetland business in North Carolina unless we had a shallow water table in yeah. all of the Eastern North Carolina and flat as a board. When you shake that really hard, the, the, the sand actually liquefies. So it would have been a, 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 a liquefied impact location, target location when the icebergs landed and they would have gone flop right into that stuff, cast out some of the sand into the pattern that we see that defines the Carolina Bay rims. And then most of the evidence would have just disappeared. Iceberg melts. Yep, maybe frozen. Some, yep. The whole yeah, landscape man. freezes everything in place right after the shockwave is gone. Yeah. And you wouldn't end up with an obvious younger driest boundary because everything was so traumatically disturbed, yes. but you would find some of the proxies in it. And that's exactly what we see. Yeah. And anyone having yeah, trouble, fantastic. anyone having trouble visualizing the liquefying ground, just go to the beach, go down yeah. to the, the wet area where the waves are moving back and forth, and then when the waves are gone and the sand's dry, just get your foot on there and sort of pat it up and down, and you'll see that it, the ground liquefies. Precisely. You just if you just vibrate the ground with your foot or your hand or whatever right there at the edge of the water, the sand and everything will liquefy until you stop, and then the water drains back down again. So, which yep, I think is a, a, a you know that's a great contribution, even if he's wrong. Yeah, because people people spent sixty years talking about you know uh, even people that are skeptics like what the hell form these yeah and to my knowledge no one ever suggested that right and that's a hell of a contribution again even if he's ultimately proven incorrect science could be moved you know that's an insight that should be run down yeah and it shouldn't be ruled out yeah absolutely I would love to yeah. see somebody reproduce that um, you know like in a movie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like the whole thing, you know, yeah. but that's just crazy. I, yeah. I just, I'd love to see more TV on it. I think that's what Carolina I mean. Yeah. Bays, I mean, you end up with so much kooky stuff on TV. Again, I like the kookiest stuff that may have happened. Yeah. <laughs> TV, you know, I mean, some of it just runs so far, so hard and so far that you're just like, this isn't as much fun as if you gave me something that was really crazy, but hell, maybe it happened. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I think the bays are great for that because everybody there, they're, they're literally a hundred million people that live within an hour's drive of a Carolina Bay and they have absolutely no idea. Yeah. And I tell you that, that frankly, it's why I'd like, I mean, I want Randall. I think Randall's going back on to Rogan here relatively soon. Is that true? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. He's got to bring up the Carolina Bays. Yeah. He does. I mean, do just it. show it to Rogan's audience. People would have a great time with that. Yep. You know, they just don't know about it yet. And anybody that's got this kind of curiosity that is introduced to them has a couple of good nights on the internet having fun looking this up <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah 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 I, randall's thing with the bays is he doesn't know what to think about them yet uh that's that's so I, I, and i told you i'm agnostic yeah right so it's one of those things that literally you'll find that people that and that's okay that say well clearly these came from space and i'm with you on that yeah the more you get into it the more you're like it's hard to say yeah so there's a level where you don't believe it a level where you do believe it, but you almost don't know as much as some other people who have 
unfortunately don't have anything better to do like me and Randall and have read every single thing ever written. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, if you go through that exercise, you kind of come out like going, well, I don't, I don't know what happened. It's a yeah. damn mystery. And yeah. we discussed mysteries last time I joined you guys. I said, yeah, it's a mystery. That's not a bad thing. Right. Yep. Yeah. Let me rephrase that. Randall thinks they're cosmically generated, but he doesn't know the mechanism yet. That's, I think that's, does he? Yeah. 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 Fair enough. Yeah. And but 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 I think they're so interesting that in the context of hey Joe, you know, yeah. this isn't certain yet, but take a look at this. Yeah. Yeah. And just show some of those LIDAR pictures, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That'd be really cool. That would be cool. All right, we'll cool tell stuff. him to do it. He does everything we say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. That's what I was trying to do. I was yeah, in a Machiavellian sense, I'm trying to manipulate our friend Randall. Yeah. Publicly, publicly, no less. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, we really appreciate you coming on. Uh, we're gonna uh, we got a hard break coming up. That's right. <laughs> Snakes, I cannot appreciate it enough, guys. Thank you so much. It's so much fun what you're doing. Stay at it. I'm glad you're young. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Thanks, George. George. <laughs> really appreciate it. Okay, man. fellas. Bye. Bye. Listening to a track sent to us by Ronnie called the, called the Texas Cobra Dance. This is the one I read the email about earlier on. He said he wrote this while listening to our podcast and thinking about Christopher Dunn's work. So, very awesome stuff there. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. Love it. Called the Texas Cobra be Dance. Be careful. <laughs> they could be laying out on the rocks in the wintertime. <laughs> That's right. Sneaky snakes. <laughs> Okay, so for the second half of the show here, what I want to do is finish the book. So I know we had, we've had we done four parts on this book already, and then, of course, we had Chris Dunn, Robert Vauter, and uh, Eric Wilson on last episode. But we're not quite done with the book, and I don't want to leave it unfinished. So there's only basically two chapters left, and there's a bunch of good stuff in here, and, like, you know, the, finishing it off. So I I, yep. I don't want to leave it undone. So Agreed. It's weird you don't want to leave it undone. Done, right. Uh, it's weird to have a part five after we had the author on, but, you know, whatever. This, we're professionals here. Yeah. <laughs> we take things as they come, and, yeah. uh, you know, the interview happens, uh, we publish. Right. Yeah. We don't like to wait. So the last thing I read was were the quotes from the pyramid texts about the king being a star. Yep. Okay. So we're going from there. So we, So Dunn says, in the English language, there are different meanings for the word power. It can mean strength, ability, or authority, as in a leader or king. It can also be, refer to the energy contained in a battery or delivered to your home through a wire. It is, is it possible that the pyramid texts refer to an environment associated with the production of power that was projected into space? Because, you know, the king is a star, right? So right, power right. is put in space. Yep. Right? He says, we may never answer, be able to answer this question, but it is one that is worth asking and thinking about. I agree with that. And, and another thing I want to point out, like from talking to Chris and Robert and Eric, it became clear to me that like a lot of this stuff that's in this book, you have to look at it as he's like blue skying speculation on stuff. You know, he's basically saying, could this be how this is? Uh, so like, the, for example, the hydrogen, hydrogen chloride, you know, uh, mixture, he's saying like, this is one way to make hydrogen, but it, there's many ways. Yep. Right. And we're just going to pick one for the sake of, you know, pointing out how this thing could work. Right. It doesn't doesn't have to be that one. It's not. Right. Because in other cases, he mentioned sulfuric acid. Yeah. Right. So it's like it's clear that he's not saying this is how it was done. So he says, I am compelled, therefore, to touch on a subject that I have been advised to avoid because it brings an element that may that is not three dimensional to my work. Every three dimensional object we use and enjoy today had its beginnings with some form of inspiration or speculative thought. This inspiration may be characterized differently by different people, but common to all is the fact that creativity transcends what we know as physical reality. If this book is going to be complete and honest, I cannot ignore the information that came into my hands recently in the form of a small blue paperback entitled Edgar Cayce on Atlantis. 
Hmm. I found this whole section to be really interesting. So his wife gives him this book. She's like, you got to check this out because you're looking at all this Egypt stuff. Right. So he says the jostling for recognition in the historical record is no different today than it was in 1922 when archaeologist Howard Carter discovered the tomb of King Tutankhamun. Recent discoveries made public by Boris Said and Tom Danley spring from a Casey follower's lifelong desire to find evidence supporting one of Casey's prophecies that there is an Atlantean Hall of Records located near the Sphinx. The follower's name is Joseph Shore, and he funded Said and Danley's sonic tests in the Great Pyramid and around the Sphinx. Yeah. So Shore is a member of the Casey Foundation, probably. A wealthy one, and he's like, so he's actually the guy getting this stuff done. This is all very interesting to me. Um, he, okay, so he says, as well as the exploration of a deep shaft that was discovered close to the causeway nearby, Dr. Zahi Hawass, the director of the Giza Plateau, facilitated these activities, perhaps hoping for an increase in tourism that would follow such a discovery. Hawass has shown support for the discovery of Casey's Hall of Records and teased before the camera in a tunnel near the Sphinx with news of what was described as a new chamber, which would be opened on live television. The promotional video was not meant to be released, but it was, and Hawass's excited promo was revealed to the public prematurely. I remember seeing some of that. It was weird. Hawass is running around in these tunnels on the Giza Plateau, claiming that it's very exciting, but there's nothing in there. But it's very exciting, right? Hmm. And then he, he kind of goes down some steps, and then he comes right back up, and he's like, well, there's nothing down there. It just ends in a wall. But you can see all these power cables going down the steps. <laughs> and you're like, okay, guy. <laughs> That's weird. <clears throat> so Dunn says, Casey's son, Edgar Evans Casey, does an admirable job explaining his father's psychic readings, which were produced while Casey was in a trance. A series of readings by Casey known collectively as reading number 440. That's interesting. Yep. With an engineer referred to in the reading as the entity. So the engineer, whenever Casey was in a trance, the person who had asked the question would, was often referred to as the entity by whatever was speaking through Casey. <laughs> that's, okay. that's crazy. Yeah. So the engineer is referred to as the entity and uh, the reading describes technologies used in Atlantis and Egypt that have an amazing similarity to the technology described in the Giza power plant theory. These readings describe the ancient Atlantean power plants, which on the surface seem far removed from the Egyptian pyramids. However, an interpretation of the readings becomes more meaningful when we compare what Casey described as the quote-unquote firestone with granite, out of which the King's Chamber, the power center in the Giza power plant, is constructed. So here's quotations from the reading itself. So this is Casey in a trance giving a quote-unquote reading to an engineer. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think basically... I'm going to say this before I get into it, but I think what Casey was, or whatever Casey was channeling or whatever was happening, what it's saying is that this, this engineer was also an engineer in previous, in a previous life and worked on these devices. Oh, okay. So the reading says about the Firestone, the entities activities then made such applications as dealt both with the constructive as well as destructive forces in that period. It would be well that there be given something of a description of this so that it may be un better understood better by the entity in the present, right? So I read that as like he's saying the uh, entity's <laughs> work, the, the yeah. engineer's work in the past. Yeah. Use both these... constructive and destructive forces in that period, way in the past. Yeah. And we're going to describe some of this for you so that you can understand what you did in the past now. Right. Got okay. <clears throat> so he says, in the center of a building which would today be said to be lined with non-conductive stone, something akin to asbestos, which I would say is from mica. <laughs> right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> with other non-conductors such as are now being manufactured in England under a name which is well known by too, too many of those who deal in such things. The building above the stone was oval or a dome, wherein there could be a portion for rolling back so that the activity of the stars, the concentration of energies that emanate from bodies that are on fire themselves, along with elements that are found and not found in the Earth's atmosphere. So, I mean, like, energy coming from space is hydrogen, right? I mean, you can see that this is interesting, right? The hmm. concentration through the prisms of glass, as would be called in the present, was in such a manner that it acted upon the instruments which were connected with the various modes of travel through induction methods which made much the same character of control as would in the present day be termed remote control 
through radio vibrations or directions. Though the kind of force impelled from the stone acted upon the motivating forces in the crafts themselves. So that it's, it's difficult to untangle some of this, but uh, I think he's talking about they're moving various types of electromag electromagnetic energy, light of various kinds, through crystals, basically, is what mm -hmm. he's talking about. At first, it sounded to me like he was talking about an observatory. The, yeah, the, yeah, the, the, the shape of the building and the dome rolls back. Yeah, and it rolls mm -hmm. back, and then the, the crystals are magnifying the light yeah, and whatnot. Yeah, could be. The building was constructed so that when the dome was rolled back, there might be little or no hindrance in the direct application of power to various crafts that were to be impelled through space, whether within the radius of vision or whether directed underwater or under other elements or through other elements. The preparation of this stone was solely in the hands of the initiates at the time, and the entity, so the engineer here, the entity was among those who directed the influences of the radiation, which arose in the form of rays that were invisible to the eye, but acted upon the stones themselves as set in the motivating forces. Whether the aircraft were lifted by the gases of the period, or whether for guiding the more, more of pleasure vehicles that might pass close to the earth, or crafts along the water or under the water. So he's saying it was powering vehicles all over the place. Yeah, <laughs> that's crazy. These then were impelled by the concentration of rays from the stone, which was centered in the middle of the power station or powerhouse, as it would be termed in the present. In the active forces of these, the entity brought destructive forces by setting up in various portions of the land the kind that was to act in producing powers for the various forms of the people's activities in the cities, the towns, and the countries surrounding the same. These not intentionally were tuned too high and brought the second period of destructive forces to the people in the land and broke up the land into those isles, which later became the scene of further destructive forces in the land. That is really strange. Yeah. So Dunn says, though Edgar K Evans Casey interprets the reading to mean that when the Atlantean... So this is Casey's son, right? Edgar Evans Casey is Casey's son. He interprets the reading to mean that when the Atlantean powerhouse was in operation, the Firestone was on fire or influenced by heat. Another more accurate interpretation can be made. The Firestone to which Casey refers is actually an accurate description of igneous rock or granite, which is igneous in this sense, meaning produced by or resulting from the action of fire. Yeah. When I read the word Firestone in reference to the Atlantean powerhouse, I immediately thought of the king's chamber, thousands of tons of granite that were prepared by those who would have possessed a higher knowledge of the sciences and arts. The crystal Casey refers to, however, is contained within the granite itself in the Great Pyramid in the form of quartz, though there very well, there very well may have been an additional solid crystal that was cut and polished to amplify the microwave input. And this may be what uh, the guy took out of the chamber that he couldn't bend around the corner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's also what Eric was talking about maybe in the Scan Pyramid's Big Void. That's right. You the need amplifier. the microwave amplifier. That's and right. he said, I think it would be very large crystals. Yeah. That's a good point, yeah. The application of Tesla technology using wireless transmission of electricity is also suggested in this passage, although Tesla's Wardenclyffe Tower research came 33 years before Casey's reading, and one could argue that Casey may have heard of this research and could have been influenced by it during the reading. What is interesting about Casey's reading is his reference to the energy of the stars and the use of these energies in conjunction with the energies he discussed in a reading in 1930. Quote, In the city of Paos in Atlantis, among people who gained understanding of application of night side of life or negative influences in the Earth's spheres, of those who gave much understanding to the manner of sound, voice, and picture, and such to the peoples of that period. It's hard to understand the, the, some of the language. that It's almost like reading a very... I've noticed this with Casey's readings. It's almost like reading a very... Well, like somebody who has a very good vocabulary, but their but English isn't their first language. That's mm -hmm. what it's like to me. There's a weird syntax, mm -hmm. you know. And Casey didn't talk like that in when he was awake. So I don't know. It's strange. It is. So Chris Dunn says his description of the power system of the Atlanteans, though, is remarkably similar to what is found within the Great Pyramid. The only thing that does not fit, seem to fit is the shape. Casey's power plant has a domed structure with the awesome Firestone located in the center of that structure. Perhaps the Great Pyramid originally had such a structure. And like we've wondered many times, is the triangle thing built over top of an original... What the original was, yeah. Yeah, so maybe the, 
the great you know the, the king's chamber was had was a, a dome, giant it had a dome over top of it it a was tower. a giant thermoelectric generator yeah <laughs> Okay, so he says, consider also Casey's statement about the conversion of energy through the Firestone. He says the energies were tuned too high and caused widespread destruction. This destruction certainly gives us pause to consider what changes would take place or what forces could unwittingly be unleashed within the Earth if such a power system was replicated. What unknown changes might we be setting in motion? Would we be faced with annihilation? Would we find ourselves on the threshold of our own past? Okay. And I meant thermoacoustic generator. Thermo-acoustic. I was looking at those. Oh, you were looking at yeah. them? Yeah. Cool. Cool stuff. Did you get how it worked or supposed to work? Sort of. I, I need to need to keep diving in. But it's 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 utilizing the difference in like the, the difference in temperature. Okay. Right. So you can like with an air conditioning system, you can have a heat pump where yeah. you run it one way. You know, you're pressurizing it on one side and it's evaporating on the other side. So you yeah. have the the um, absorption of heat energy, right, or the um, uh, dissipation of it. Yeah, you're moving so, heat around one way or the exactly. other. Exactly. Yeah. So that's that's kind of the way it works, but it's using sound waves as the as the uh, the thing that's actually moving the heat. Oh, okay. It's huh. acoustic waves because the pressure side of the wave is hot, right? All the all the molecules are smashed together and they're energetic. Yeah. Right? So they're really hot. And then the the rarefied side of the wave is obviously cold. Everything's far apart. And it's not yeah. moving around very much. Things aren't smashing into each other. Yeah. So the stack that he was talking about is set up between these the these these two, you know, the hot and cold. And somehow, the, the way the stack is designed, I, I believe, the standing wave of sound in there, it actually, the stack sort of separates the hot area is, is actually hotter than, or the, um, excuse me, the pressure side of the wave is hotter than the hot side, and the vacuum side of the wave is colder than the cold side. Okay. Huh. Are these things loud? I mean, what's that? The, I don't know. <laughs> I'm wondering, like, you got a standing wave like that, and it's just like, wah, you know, is it really loud or is it infrasound or uh, how would that work? Well, I guess if it was in audible range, it would, it would be loud. Be pretty loud, yeah. But yeah, if it, the, the pyramid was infrasound, right. So if it was a thermoacoustic generator and infrasound, then you'd feel it. Yeah, you'd feel it. But it would be, Not you'd just be a, it. yeah, be a vibrational hum, like a, you just, you know. Yeah. Small earthquake, no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, really, really interesting stuff. And I obviously I don't fully get it yet, but uh, didn't yeah. have much time to to look into it. But I will yeah. try to grok. Yeah. Okay, so we are on chapter fifteen now, called "Lessons from the Past." He says, "When I look far into the past, I can discern the existence of sciences of which there are no surviving records." Man, I agree with that. <laughs> They have either been destroyed or complete records never existed. Did science account for the amazing artifacts I have seen throughout Egypt? And did science also explain, at least in part, this culture's demise? When I looked for an event in Egyptian history that would explain the destruction of this culture, and at the same time explain the erosion of the pyramids, I found a clue in the 1985 discovery of volcanic ash 20 feet underground in the Nile Delta. This ash was found to be identical to that from an enormous eruption that occurred approximately 3,500 years ago on the Greek island of Santorini. Mm -hmm. The eruption is estimated to have been 22,000 times more destructive than the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. Here was a partial answer. However, it was becoming clearer to me that another reason for the destruction of a civilization can be related to its use and or abuse of the technology it develops. It is reasonable to assume that if we were to destroy ourselves through nuclear holocaust, the geological and biological record would bear witness to it and reveal that knowledge to future archaeologists as they became more advanced in their sciences. At the same time, some of our civil engineering projects might survive, and the occasional archaeological anomaly might turn up to promote some thought in that direction. See, I I love how... I, I keep getting this, but I love how looking at these kinds of things starts making people think about stuff like that, <laughs> about how, you know, how, how often do you, what are we, what is our civilization going to look like to people 10,000 years right. from now? Right. You know? Yeah. 
Because those are the questions you start asking. Like, we're advanced and we know it. We're advanced in various ways. Will they think we are advanced 10,000 years from now when they're looking back, if there's been a destruction between now and then? You know, how obvious it will it be to those people way in the future that we are advanced? Yeah. It may not be very obvious <laughs> That's right. until people start finding weird anomalous artifacts and then they'll try to point it out and they'll be called a, a, a crank, bunch of the scriptards will be yeah, like, no, that's. Out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because mostly they'll be finding people, Kyle's like napping projects, and they'll be like, <laughs> this is what they were doing, right? <laughs> Great, thanks. Just play me. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be your fault. <laughs> okay. He says, perhaps a granite surface plate could be found. And some would puzzle over the positioning of the holes drilled into it. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe some future, quote unquote, primitive tribe would find a granite surface plate and see some significance to this plate and make a ritual object out of it. Yes. You know, and then it's in their secret secret of, and they won't let any more advanced people come look at it later because it's their secret ritual object and you just don't know that there's this like badass super advanced surface plate in there. Yeah. And they've been, you know, sacrificing goats on it. Or they, yeah, they develop, <laughs> they develop some entire cultural thing on it and yeah. it just, we yeah. would never know. And if some, you know, enterprising anthropologist gets a look at it and there's weird markings on the side that say, you know, so-and-so granite company and, you yeah. know, but they won't be able to read it. It'll yeah. be the only example of that text ever found. And, you know. <laughs> it's just great. <laughs> Flatness.com. <laughs> Get your service plates. <laughs> I remember the picture that somebody sent to us. Mm -hmm. It was like he was doing a house renovation project and they found this old granite flat plate. You yeah. Know, a surface plate in there. So, yeah, if that thing, you know, vanishes, it just disappears into the hillside and f is found thousands and thousands of years from now, what will people think of it? Will they be able to tell that it had some incredibly precise flatness? If it was, if it's protected, you know, someone like Chris Dunn might be like, you know, this was really flat. Like, <laughs> <this is> like <laughs> okay. So he says world history records the rise and fall of many empires and with their endings, the vast destruction of property. It occurred to me that in the case of the earlier Egyptians, the cause of their demise was perhaps a little more catastrophic than any other historically recorded downfall or disaster. How catastrophic? If we look closely at the following evidence, perhaps we will begin to understand what such an event could have been. We now know that the ancient Egyptians had a higher level of science and technology than what, than what has been previously supposed. We also know that the development of technology and machines that harness and control the forces of nature holds negative, perhaps even catastrophic, consequences to those who do not control or use them wisely. When we consider the development of the atom bomb, nuclear power plants, and even the automobile, it is clear that the potential for harm is present with every machine in existence. I agree with that. There's Technology is neither good nor bad. It can be used for either. Yep. But how far did the ancients develop their technology? Some researchers have suggested that civilizations in antiquity had actually developed and used atomic power. On the surface, this sounds rather incredible, but then there is so much that has not survived the ancient pyramid builders, it would not be out of order to see what these researchers have to say about this. Brad Steiger presented a forceful argument that in prehistory, nuclear explosions had affected several areas of the Earth. He cited the discovery of fused green glass in deep stratas of the Earth and in Gabon, Africa, the Euphrates Valley, the Sahara Desert, the Gobi Desert, the Mojave Desert, and in Iraq. These vast wastelands of melted sand can be compared to white sands in New Mexico, where the sands were fused as a result of nuclear bomb testing. Steiger wrote, quote, Perhaps the most mo potentially mind-boggling evidence of an advanced prehistoric technology that might have blown its parent culture away is to be found in those sites which ostensibly bear mute evidence of pre-Genesis nuclear reactions. At the same time, scientists have found a number of uranium deposits that appear to have been mined or depleted in antiquity. Wow. Yeah. And why not? Right. <clears throat> So he says, since vast regions of the globe still remain unexplored, it is impossible to say how many glassy areas there are just in the Sahara. 
If we were looking for areas where tremendous heat influenced terrestrial characteristics, like the heat that could be produced by nuclear forces, we have to only look in the previously mentioned deserts. Although these may not in themselves prove that prehistoric nuclear war had created them, there are many people who believe this was the case. If our world were affected by a cataclysmic event, such as a polar displacement, or a comet strike, or self-inflicted nuclear war, after 10,000 years, future generations would have few clues about the level of sophistication we had achieved. It would be fair to say that many of our artifacts would be misinterpreted and misunderstood. What would, rem what would remain of the concrete jungles we call cities? Would they reveal to future archaeologists the full scope of our technological achievements? Future civilizations would be busy developing their own tech. Their development might be among a, along a completely different path than ours, and in its early stages, it would not be as advanced. At what stage in their evolution would future archaeologists recognize a computer chip for what it really is? Yeah. Yeah, these are all very good questions. And, like, so much archaeology has been done, you know, like, if it wasn't, if you think about, if they had technology that's, that's comparable to today, if you're doing archaeology on that 50 years ago, would you even recognize it? If somebody did successfully translate some texts, you know, they were talking about some of our tech. Yeah. It's like, okay, they believed that they had tablets that connected all of them to each other. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Some crazy religious yeah. bullshit. <laughs> yep. You're right. <laughs> they were reading messages. Yeah. On tablets. Right. <laughs> from people on the other side of the planet. Right. And they, and they, you know, the, the implication is that they were stone tablets. And so they're thinking like, right, right, a message from a stone tablet on that side of the planet would appear magically on the stone tablet on the exactly. other side of the planet. I don't think so. Yeah. So yeah. Dunn says, but what, but clues to what happened to us could be discerned from sources other than human made objects. Nature would retain the imprint of a nuclear holocaust. For example, the release of neutrons would sharply increase the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere, and it would show up in biological remains like wood and bone and other organic material from that period. C-14 is created when the reaction of cosmic rays with the ionosphere precipitates neutrons through the atmosphere. These neutrons react with nitrogen-14, creating carbon-14. Immediately upon its creation, C-14 begins to decay. Originally, it was determined to have a half-life of approximately 5,568 years. The half-life of radiocarbon was redefined from 5,570 plus or minus 30 to 5,530 5, plus or minus 40. Sorry. What? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so now it's defined as 5,730 plus or minus 40. Okay. Organic material takes in carbon-14 at a constant rate. And knowing what the level of C in an object was before it died, scientists can measure the amount left in it and calculate its age. Apart from normal variations, carbon-14 stays at a constant level in the Earth's atmosphere. However, modern nuclear activities have increased the level of C-14 in the atmosphere, and subsequently everything in everything that lives and breathes. When Willard mm. F. Libby first discovered radiocarbon dating in 1947, archaeologists and especially Egyptologists ignored it. They questioned its reliability, as it did not coincide with the quote-unquote known historical dates of the artifacts being tested. David Wilson, author of The New Archaeology, wrote, quote, Some archaeologists refused to accept radiocarbon dating. The attitude of the majority, probably in the early days of the new technique, was summed up by Professor Joe Brew, director of the Peabody Museum at Harvard. He said, If a carbon-14 date supports our theories, we put it in the text. If it does not entirely contradict them, we put it in a footnote. And if it is completely out of date, we just drop it. Which is this classic. <clears throat> God, it's annoying. Anyway, so he talks about, he's getting up to how they started to calibrate. And he goes, the answer to calibration came in the form of tree ring dating. And the tree that eventually provided the means to accomplish this accurate C-14 dating was the bristlecone pine, which is indigenous to the southwestern United States. As the oldest living tree on Earth, the bristlecone pine enabled scientists to develop the chronology, to calibrate carbon dating, and to adjust that clock. The results are noteworthy. It turned out that the Egyptologists and the archaeologists were correct in their dates, and the original C-14 results were in error. In some cases, for distant dates, the error was as much as 800 years. 
But this finding had more than one interpretation. The Egyptologists may be correct in their historical timeline, or there may have been an unexplained infusion of C-14 into the atmosphere at some prehistoric time. David Wilson summed up the argument in this way, quote, If present-day measurements of the radiocarbon remaining in objects which died in, say, 2500 BC, give a date of 2000 BC, then that means there is too much, quote-unquote, carbon left undecayed. So in other words, you get a younger date because there's more C-14, right? right? Per, uh, perhaps there, it is that there was too much carbon-14 in the object originally in right. 2500 BC. This is now generally accepting as, accepted as being the case, but that still leaves the question open as to why there was more carbon-14 in the atmosphere and biosphere. So in other words, the calibration was that they said, okay, if it, if it came from this period, we know that it has more C-14 in it. Yeah. Okay. So now they've calibrated their, their... So when they're looking at what's left over from decaying, they're like, okay, we know that given this period, it had more in it, so we can start from that starting point. Right. So he says, that leaves still leaves the question open as to why there was more carbon-14 in the atmosphere and biosphere. And that question is still open, although scientists have speculated that if the latter scenario is true, there was more C-14 in the ancient atmosphere than they would expect... The answer might be that variations in the Earth's magnetic field allowed increased amounts of cosmic rays to react with the ionosphere. So he says, tree ring dating had revealed that there was an elevation of C-14 in the atmosphere and in artifacts older than 1000 BC, which had thrown off the atomic clock that they were using to date stuff with. Around 8000 BC to 10,000 BC, the level of C-14 starts to fall back to quote-unquote normal. So 10,000 BC is 12,000 years, years ago. ago. Yes. So you have an enormous infusion of C14 into the atmosphere and thus into the biosphere that doesn't start to fall off until 1000 BC. Wait a second. So it got out of whack between 10,000 and 8,000 BC. Yeah, somewhere between Earliest date, 10,000 B.C. to latest date, 8,000 B.C. It got out of whack. Yeah, okay, yeah. So And then it slowly drops off until you get to about 1,000 B.C., and then after that, it's more normal. Right. And before that, it's quote-unquote normal. So we're looking at the same Younger Dryas period This would be the end of the Younger Dryas. yeah. Because it's 11,000, 11,6 to 12,8. Yeah. Is the beginning, or... Yes, the onset. Right. Nuclear winter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he says, what we are forced to consider is whether the high level of C-14 in prehistoric artifacts is a quote-unquote smoking gun left behind by a highly evolved civilization 10,000 years ago. And I actually think he means... Well, 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. Or is it 11, 8, 12, 6? I can't remember. I always get those things backwards. Sorry. <laughs> as I have argued, a complete interpretation of a civilization such as ours is beyond the scope of one individual or group of individuals who are trained in only one discipline. So, yeah, I think that's right. You know, the question is, is, are, are, is this elevated level of C-14 a smoking gun? And it is a smoking gun of something. We just don't yeah. know what it is. So the younger, driest people, George Howard and his pe and his group, are looking at it as some kind of cosmic impact. Yeah, I just don't know if that would cause an elevated C fourteen. We I, that's a question I should have asked him while we had him on, but I forgot. I mean out. the the if if there was some kind of like bolide, uh, like an explosion, it could have thousands of times. The power of the of a nuclear blast. Yeah, but it's a different kind of blast. I mean, mm -hmm. it's the same energy level, but it isn't the same uh, reaction happening. Mm -hmm. So I just don't know if it will create C-14. Yeah, okay. Because that, that requires some really weird nuclear stuff to take place. So maybe that maybe just the energy level of the blast would cause it. I don't know, you know. I'm, yeah, I don't either. Okay. CME could do it? Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Because the CME, like, if you've got cosmic rays are what normally causes it, so CME can have the same effect. Yeah. yeah. Enormous blasts from That's the sun. That's what shock thinks. You yes. Know, shock yeah. theory. Right. So like Randall says, it may be a combination of both. Yeah. 
or one was an impact and the other was the other thing. The nuclear war. Yeah. The nuclear <laughs> war or the sun exploding yeah. or something. The impact happens and they're all like, shit, and then yeah. they have a fight and then it's over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yep. Let's take a break. Yeah. determined <laughs> to finish this book so we are back for the last and uh, final segment of the final hour <laughs> which the final hour is already over yeah it's the third hour final segment some yeah <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> okay buddy All right. let's go the ancient Indian Sanskrit text, the Mahabharata, is a work that has no precise chronological origin. It is estimated that it was written around 400 BC, but probably was copied from earlier texts from a much earlier date. A complete translation in 11 volumes, though unelegant in some scholars' minds, was made by Kesari Mohan Ganguly and published under the name P. Chandra Roy between 1883 and 1896. The work is replete with references to terrible wars that involve the use of weapons that we normally do not associate with the primitive warriors of prehistory. The writer or writers of the Mahabharata seemed to exaggerate or get confused when describing weapons that, given the era in which they were used, should have been limited to swords, spears, and bows and arrows. Was it imagination or wishful thinking that prompted the writers to describe weapons that included missiles, and birds that swooped down from the heavens, issuing forth fire to demolish entire forests. There also was a terrifying device that moved in a way that, if considered to be a simple projectile, defied the laws of physics. Quote, Thus the terrifying tumult of war was rampant when the gods Nara and Narayana joined the battle. The blessed Lord Visnu, upon seeing the divine bow in Nara's hand, called up with his mind the... Danavada's destroying disc. No sooner thought of than the enemy burning disc appeared from the sky in a blaze of light matching the sun's with its razor sharp circular edge. The disc Sundarsana, terrible, invincible, and supreme. And when the fiercely blazing, terror spreading weapon had come to hand, God Akuta or Visnu, with arms like elephant trunks, loosed it, and it zigzagged fast as a flash in a blur of light, raising the enemy's strongholds. Effulgent like the fire of doomsday, it felled foe after foe, impetuously tearing asunder thousands of Devanas and Daitas as the hand of the greatest of men let go of it in the battle. Here it was ablaze licking like a fire, there it cut down with vehemence the forces of the Asuras. How it was hurled into the sky, then into the ground, and like a ghoul it drank blood in that war. Wow. <laughs> Dunn says, as, as though to answer our question, the text later refers to the uh, elixir. Is that how you say that? Elixir? Elixir. That brought an added dimension to the ancient Indian wars so that they more closely parallel our own. Quote, when that grand bird had rid them all of life, he strode across them to look for the elixir. He saw fire everywhere, blazing fiercely. It filled all the skies with its flames, burning hot and razor sharp rays and evil under the stirring of the wind. Unquote. Then as, to then, as if to make an association between the elixir and its use, quote, he saw in front of the elixir an iron wheel with a honed edge and sharp blades, which ran incessantly like the fire and sun. And behind the wheel, he saw two big snakes shimmering like blazing fires, tongues darting like lightning, mouths blazing, eyes burning, looks venomous, no less powerful than gruesome, in a perpetual rage and fierce that stood guard over that elixir, their eyes ever baleful and never blinking. Whomever either snake's eyes were to fall upon would turn into ashes, unquote. This passage brings to mind the important role gasoline has played in modern war, not only as a weapon, but as a fuel for vehicles. Could the elixir have been the gasoline that fueled these ancient conflagrations? Mm-hmm. 
So he says, filled with anger and vindictiveness, Parasurama brought forth a mighty weapon of Brahma. Okay, so this is more quoting from the... Um, so he says, on my part, I produce the same excellent weapon of Brahma in order to counter the effect of his weapon. Those two weapons of Brahma met each other in midair without being able to... Oop, got a note from Brad. <laughs> <laughs> without being able to reach either Rama or myself. Around them, a, bla a flame blazed forth and living things were greatly afflicted thereby, unquote. As though to indicate the power of these mighty missiles, the ancient storytellers wrote, thus sped by that mighty warrior, the shaft endowed with the energy of the sun caused all the points of the compass to blaze with light, unquote. So Dunn says, knowing that the energy of the sun comes from the fusion of hydrogen atoms, the thought of hydrogen bombs brings terrible visions of vast destruction, mushroom clouds, and insidious radiation wafting across the land. These visions are included in other books that reference the Mahabharata as testimony of nuclear war in prehistory. In We Are Not the First, author Andrew Thomas wrote, A blazing missile possessed of the radiance of smokeless fire was discharged. A thick gloom suddenly encompasses the heavens. Clouds roared into the higher air, showering blood. The world, scorched by the heat of that weapon, seemed to be in a fever. Thus describes the Drona Parva a page of the unknown past of mankind. One can almost visualize the mushroom cloud of an atomic bomb explosion and atomic radiation. Another passage compares the detonation with the flare-up of 10,000 suns. So I think hmm. it, basically what he's trying to get out here, and I've seen people do this, is that it sounds like a very technological war was being waged in yeah. this ancient Vedic text that was that has been carried down since... Time immemorial. No one knows how old the stories are. Right. They they've traced the they think they've traced the original writing to like 600 BC, but they're obviously much older than that because they were an old tradition already when they were written down at that period. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. So Dunn says Frederick Soddy, a British chemist and Nobel Prize winner for his work on the origin and nature of isotopes, discerned a vastly different meaning in the words than he's than in these words than his contemporaries. Regarding the ancient Indian scriptures in 1909, before the Atomic Age, he wrote, quote, Can we not read into them some justification for the belief that some former forgotten race of men attained not only to the knowledge we have so recently won, but also the power that is not yet ours? <coughs> Saudi's work with British physicist Ernest Rutherford, or Rutherford, Rutherford had, yeah, added to our understanding of the atom, and led to the splitting of its nucleus by Sir John D. Cockroft and Ernest T. Walton in 1932. Saudi believed that civilizations in the past were familiar with the awesome power contained within the atom and had suffered the consequences of its misuse. In 1910, he wrote in his book, Radium, quote, Some of the beliefs and legends bequeathed to us by antiquity are so universal and firmly established that we have become accustomed to consider them as being almost as ancient as humanity itself. Nevertheless, we are tempted to inquire how far the fact that some of these beliefs and legends have so many features in common is due to chance, and whether the similarity between them may not point to the existence of an ancient, totally unknown, and unsuspected civilization of which all other traces have since disappeared. Yeah. This is the guy that helped split the atom. That's crazy. Thomas pointed out that a skeleton was discovered in India that had up to 50 times more radioactivity than normal. He also puzzled over a meeting he had with Pundit Kanaya Yogi. He wrote, quote, According to Pundit Kanaya Yogi of Ambatur Madras, whom I met in India in 1996, the original time measurement of the Brahmins was sexagesimal, and he quoted the Brihath uh, Sathaka and other Sanskrit sources. In ancient times, the day was divided into 60 kala, each equal to 24 minutes. Those were subdivided into 60 V kala, each equal to 24 seconds. Then followed a further 60-fold subdivision of time into para tapara, vitapara, ima, and finally kashta, or one uh, 300 billionth of a second. <laughs> the Hindus have never been in a hurry, and one wonders what use the Brahmins made of these fractions of a microsecond. While in India, the author was told that the learned Brahmins were obliged to preserve this tradition from a hoary antiquity, but they themselves did not understand it. Is this reckoning of time a folk memory from a highly technological civilization? Without sensitive instruments, the kashta would be absolutely meaningless. 
it is significant that the Kashta, or three, uh, three times a to the ten eighth of a second, ten to the eighth power of a second, is very close to the lifespans of certain mesons and hyperons. Uh, mesons. Mesons. Yeah. And hyper hyperons. I don't know. How to say that one either. Yeah, I'm, I'm down with that pronunciation. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> this fact supports the bold hypothesis that the science of nuclear physics is not new. The Varahamira table, dated BC 550, indicates even the size of the atom. The mathematical figure is fairly com comparable with the actual size of a hydrogen atom. So what he's pointing out is they have these ancient traditions of these tiny, tiny, tiny fractions of a second of time. that no one can possibly use in real life. Right, but, the, but we are using them to describe. They are in. They are the half life or the very useful in atomic decay science. rate of yeah of these tiny particles. Right. Yep. What do we call them nowadays? Uh, tetraseconds. Yeah. Nanoseconds. Nanoseconds. Yeah. But that the smallest one was one three hundred billionth of a second. Yeah. Or three hundred millionth. I think that's. Let me look at that number again. Zero, 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 zero. Yeah, 300 million. <laughs> <laughs> so Dunn says, that said, what? What are you looking for? I'm going to look up a tetrasecond. Tetrasecond. Dunn says, that said, I would like now to revisit one of those deductions, the one that suggests the Egyptians understood the properties of gravity. It has been speculated on more than one occasion and by more than one person that this ancient civilization had the technology to neutralize the effects of gravity. If this were true, then the technological tools Egyptologists look for as evidence that the Egyptians were not primitive, such as the wheel or specific machinery, might never have existed, because the Egyptians would not have needed them. The simple fact is that the tools and machines we find so necessary in our gravity-bound civilization would not have been needed in a society that was able to control gravity. If we were to develop the technology to overcome gravity, the energy expenditure of the peoples of the world would be sharply curtailed. Along with our diminished need for energy, we would no longer require many other ancillary products of an advanced society. Huge oil refineries, tire manufacturers, large manufacturing plants churning out massive engines and vehicle transmissions, and hundreds of thousands of miles of highways would conceivably become obsolete. So what is it? What's the Can't find it yet. Okay. But yeah, that's the. I I had my internal dialogue going here. Yeah, so, yeah. but it's but right. that's that's when he was talking about uh, if we if we master master gravity. gravity. Yes. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Obsolete yeah. highways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they would become so like awesome. they'd become like enormous parks. Think about yeah. that. Yeah. You know. Get rid of all the all the and asphalt. you just have these bridges and everything yeah, going all over the place. And, and like you, can... you just have long stretches of flat grass, you know. And it's yeah. like you know, it'd be cool. But the, like the yeah, the inter intersections with these huge bridges and stuff yeah. would be like interesting walkways, or people right. be riding their bicycles on yeah, it. Like, exactly. <laughs> yeah. and people would probably have races with old because there would yeah, still be like yeah, car yeah. enthusiasts, and then everyone yeah. would hate. It. You'd start your car and people would be like, oh god, that stinks, because yeah. <laughs> no one would be used to smelling that stuff anymore. <laughs> You know, those things are bad for you. <laughs> yeah. I read an old sci-fi story. It was a short story about that where they had uh, they had the free park in one of the big cities. And, of course, nobody had any – nobody used gasoline anymore. But they were enthusiasts, right? Yeah. And in free parks, you were able to do anything you wanted. <laughs> okay? And so this guy got an old lawnmower out there. And he had gotten the two-cycle engine to work. And he manages to get it started. And, of course, it belches out all this smoke. And then he starts mowing the grass in the park. But it smelled so awful that the people, all these people came up and ripped it apart. They were just like, ah, turn that thing off. <laughs> okay. So Dunn says, my theory is that the Great Pyramid was the ancient Egyptians' power plant. However radical the idea may seem, it is, in my mind, supported by hard archaeological evidence. The artifacts reveal that the ancient Egyptians used advanced machining methods, which supports the deduction that their civilization, and perhaps others, was technologically advanced. Nevertheless, even with the powerful evidence I have presented throughout this book, and the growing support for such ideas, there is still a mountain of evidence, or lack of it, that prevents this theory's total acceptance. I acknowledge this truth, and I am open to revising my power plant theory if another theory presents itself to explain all the anomalies in the ancient artifacts and pyramids I have examined to build my own case. 
One of the most inconceivable events with which modern humans are faced is nuclear disaster. Though the threat of an all-out nuclear war between the United States and former Soviet Union has been greatly reduced, it is still possible that our civilization could be wiped out, wiped from the face of the earth by a few miscalculations in foreign policy, a reckless terrorist act, or an error or malfunction in our own nuclear weapons or devices, the ones supposedly protecting us from a premature reaction to a non-existent threat. Could this happen? Most of us believe that we, as a species, are simply too smart for these possibilities to overtake us. Has it happened before? Were the ancient Egyptians smart enough to ensure that their own civilization would endure? The greatest lessons regarding our own mortality may begin with the pyramids of Egypt. The strong evidence of advanced machining practiced by the ancient Egyptians, the geological and biological records, and the world's ancient sacred records. These are all pieces of a giant puzzle that so many of us are trying to piece together. I have hope that we will regain this lost knowledge and learn from the lessons of the far distant past in time to save our own society from the fate that likely befell advanced civilizations that came before us. And I hope that along with granting us the wisdom to survive, this knowledge may also provide us the means, the means through which we can evolve spiritually, intellectually, and technologically into more than we have ever chanced to dream. End of book. All right. Yes, yes, yes. Very, very fine stuff. Fantastic book. Yeah. Go get it. Everyone needs to get it. So here's what I was thinking. Zepto second. Zepto. Yeah. And I'm I'm looking at this, and I think this is either one hundred sextillionth of a second, <laughs> or it's one what septillionth. So no, trillion. Quadrillion, quintillion, oh, okay. sextillion. So that's much smaller than what we were just looking at. Septillion. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, yeah, much smaller than 300 million. 300 million. Yeah. But still, that's, yeah. I've heard Sean Carroll say zeptosecond mm. before. <laughs> that's what that was the one I was thinking. So what's of. a nanosecond then? What's the division of that? Um, um, 1,000 millionth. Huh? A nanosecond is an s. Let's see, a unit of time equal to one thousand millionth of a second, or one billionth of a second. Okay, so a nanosecond is still smaller than what we were looking at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one billionth of a second. Yeah. yeah. Zeptosecond <laughs> is. That's really small. Yeah. <laughs> But still, who need, who in our normal everyday life, non-technological life, needs a division of a second that's one three hundred millionth of a second? Right. You yeah. can't possibly use it. Not in everyday life, no. You can't unless you unless can't you were like some kind of weird unless, monk, you know. You can't measure it unless you have something that can Precision measure divisions. Yeah. 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 So why would Brahmins be preserving an ancient tradition of three hundred millionths of a second? Yep. Yep. <laughs> I think that's genius. That's just another one of those little, that's one of, you know, snake fact. Yep, snake fact. Yeah. Don't keep it to yourself, folks. <laughs> <laughs> it's the dirtiest deed you can do is keep those snake facts to yourself. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's up there. Okay. Are you looking for your, yeah, your looking for page of stuff? Page of ending stuff. What? Where? Oh, man, it's been a great journey. Oh, yeah. So you guys can get a hold of us, brothers of the serpent at gmail.com. Check out the website, brothers of the serpent.com. Uh, check out the encyclopedia there, the glossary, the snake skins, which is our merchandise. T-shirts. Uh, yeah, we got t-shirts and all kinds of stuff. We're also, we got an embroidery pattern happening. Uh, so we may it's be already able to, done. Yeah, yeah. So we may be able to make hats and beanies. We and will stuff. be able to make, we can. Yeah. We actually just need to go by there and, and say, hey, put this on a hat. Right. So we're it's not our, sure how much they're going to cost yet. And we'll have to ship them ourselves. So well, we'll you can, out. You, we can bring a hat into the store and say, embroider it on this. Oh, okay. Right. Got it. So, you know, we're going to try to turn this into a product, but we don't want to be a, um, you know, Amazon sweatshop. Yeah. So <laughs> we only have one little kid. <laughs> That's right. And, uh, he can't possibly do all the work. So. <laughs> yeah. But maybe 
one of these days, you know, if you have that special hat that's like your favorite hat and you want to mail it over yeah, to us, yeah, send it to us. We'll get it embroidered and we'll send it back. I'll, we'll wear, keep I'll it. wear it for a while and then I'll send it back. To you. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna figure something out. Yeah, yeah, and we may we may end up ordering um, like a bulk thing of hats or beanies and stuff. Um, and then giving them out at events because I don't want to be mailing stuff. Ah, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. So we could get a bunch and then we could bring them and then people can get them at events and stuff like that. I don't know. I don't know. We'll, we'll figure or it out. Or History We're Shift talking. can buy like 50 of them from us. Yeah. And <laughs> mail them and to all of you. he can do all the mailing. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> We're going to figure this out. Yeah. With y'all's help. We got the embroidery pattern. Laura, the lovely Laura. Yeah. Got the embroidery pattern done for us for Christmas. Yeah, it looks great. So, so also uh, help us out with the pyramid scheme on the website. There you can find the py- the Snake Road pyramid scheme that sends us straight to pyramids, which means we get it we get to get out in the field and hopefully one day actually visit some pyramids with Dunn. Yeah, and Robert and Eric. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so you can also you can join our Patreon there or just give us a one time donation over PayPal. And thanks to all of you who have done that so much. You help it's really helping us out. Uh, also, really uh, give the shows reviews. Go to iTunes and get reviews. We've gotten one in the past month, so step it up, guys. You know, we got a bunch of reviews on there, but I'm not seeing very many coming. Come on. <laughs> you guys are making me unhappy here. <laughs> Take a couple of time, a couple of minutes out of your time and go on there and be like, Snake Rose Park, yeah! Five stars. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Share the shows anywhere you can. Follow us on Twitter at Snake Rose and No Vowels, SNKBRS. Join the Facebook group run by Jordan. Join the Discord, which is being moderated by Jeff, who also runs the Library of the Serpent. So we thank him very much. The Discord's great. Yeah. Like, I, I'm learning so much about the Snake Force in the Discord. We talk I know, all the it's really cool. Yeah, like, I've learned that uh, Ryan, he doesn't press buttons, he smashes them. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and History Shift does not have a period key on his keyboard. They're all exclamation right. marks. Right. Even his questions end in exclamation marks. <laughs> so I'm learning things about the Snake Force here. So join the Discord. You can find that on the website as well. You can see it up there, Discord, Snake Bros, the Snake then, Bit Discord chat. And then when you meet him in person, he's like, hey, how's it going? Yeah. <laughs> when you read what he's saying, he's like, hey, guys, holy crap. <laughs> and then you meet him, he's like, hey, man, what's going on? <laughs> it's real chill. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, so that's History Shift. Don't forget to follow him at History Shift on, U- on uh, Twitter. Find him on YouTube and his website, HistoryShift.com. Also follow Pod Doodles. He takes our podcasts and turns them into doodles that you can watch. It's really awesome. And, our, of course, our podcast with Randall Carlson, Cosmographia. Check that out. And then these, there's the CAC 2020 Scabland Strip. There's still some spots left, so if you guys want to go, sign up now. Get a hold of Darren at Grimerica.com. It. Oh, yep. we just went on uh, Where Did the Road Go show, so that should be being published in Soraya's feed pretty soon. Yeah, he doesn't know when, I asked. Okay. Not sure yet. Not sure but, yet, but uh, it's coming up. So it will be coming up. It's a, it's a like, all uh, Where Did the Road Go space for the news. It was really fun. Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah, guys. And thanks so much to him for inviting us on. It yeah. Was fun. Love you. Yep. Always have. Always will. Good night, Get Adamu. back to work. <laughs> Get back go to work. Go take a break. And such...